You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're covering Georgia. So, Kenzie. Yes, Lauren. Let's get scary. Woohoo! We are back to our news broadcaster sound. <laughs> Although I think this might be a little bit better. I hope so. I timed it when we were just chatting earlier, and it's like a two-second delay. Yeah. Cool. It just It will just sound like we're really thinking about our responses and that we're just really smart. Yeah, we could, like, pause and give each other, like, 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Is that too long? That's too long. I said our pauses are usually two seconds. <laughs> oh, so two. <laughs> 30 seconds yeah it would be a little bit long people would be like oh my god did the did it break (laughs) did you just count to two to see how long two seconds was no oh did Mackenzie? (laughs) no No, lauren god (laughs) maybe i'm just stupid (laughs) i mean it it takes me a second to process (laughs) all right well well, since we since we both have long episodes this week, why don't we just jump on into Georgia? Oh, wait, yeah. real quick beforehand. <laughs> what? what? Um, I saw a news article about one of the Manson family members. Um, she was oh. just released from jail. Shut up. Yeah, so she was just released, I think, yesterday or the day before. Um, I did not do the research on it to like talk about it beforehand because I was too busy on these notes. Um, but yeah, so maybe next episode. I can talk a little bit about it, but yeah, she was either released or is on like on parole or something where people are very upset about the fact that she's now released and she's like 70 something. I mean, I guess principle of the matter, but what the fuck is she It is the principle of the matter. Well, there was that, remember um, Nanny Doss who I covered? Oh, that's right. Yeah, there are some, maybe not Nanny Doss. Oh, the giggling grandma, whoever that one was. Um, Yeah, they kill when they're like older. Yeah. But I, I I really would like to know what her state of mind is at this point. Like, is she still like, ah, oh, Charlie, so great? Or is like she had her come to Jesus, pun intended. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I will do some research and I'll try to see what I can find. All right. And we can maybe good. hopefully talk about that on our next episode. Okay. Sounds All good. right. Let's jump into Georgia. These actually, everything about this one is going to be long. The state facts are long. Our cases are long. Well, buckle up, folks. We're in for oh, a long yeah. one. Hopefully, Hopefully you're on a really road trip like the sound of our voice. Well, if you've listened this long, I think they do. Well, if you're new, we hope you really like the sound of our voice. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome. All right. And welcome. Georgia. So in 1970, uh, nope. <laughs> Great start. <laughs> In 1732, James Oglethorpe used the colony of Georgia as a place he would send prisoners who were unable to pay their debts. So it was founded as a felon colony. Hmm. Just kind of like uh, Australia. Australia. Aussie. Aussie, mate. <laughs> but then King George II demanded that the colony make money for Britain. So it was established as a traditional royal colony instead. Macon's Wesleyan College. Sometimes I think you save the big words just for me. (laughs) Yeah, I search big facts about this state that use big words. Big facts for big words. (laughs) (laughs) Macon's Westland College was the first university in the world to award degrees to women. Hell yeah. It was founded as a women's college in 1836 under the name Georgia Female College. Sounds very unique. Yeah. (laughs) no question as to what it is (laughs) straight and to the point in 1864 savannah was given to president lincoln as a christmas gift wow i want a christmas gift the town of savannah Mm -hmm. not a girl named savannah uh, (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) when did the civil war end though i don't know you're the history person I can't remember if it ended or started in 1863. I thought it started in 1863. It started in 61 and it ended in 65. So it's weird that Georgia, maybe like they knew they were losing. So Georgia was like, here, take us back into the United States and have a town. (laughs) And have a town. (laughs) 
<laughs> Unless we just didn't have Georgia yet. Okay. We're going down a rabbit hole. Yeah, we are. Okay. <laughs> Georgia could fit into the state of Alaska 10 times. So what this means is... <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I see one of those facts, I'm just like, okay, it's going in. In 1943, Georgia was the first to lower the age of voting from 21 to 18. Expedition Bigfoot is a 4,000 square foot space in Cherry Log that has a ton of big Bigfoot artifacts and info on sightings and such. I feel like every state has a Bigfoot story. Oh, yeah. I think they all do. Some are named something different, but I think they all have, like, some form of Bigfoot. Okay. He just travels. (laughs) (laughs) One Bigfoot traveler. 56. All around. (laughs) Yep. He's the, he's the, um, nope, popped out of my head. Now it wouldn't be funny (laughs) because it'd take too long to think of it. (laughs) At Mysteria Antiques in Moretta, Georgia, you can see a two-headed cow. I think that was in... Um, like, do you remember those Ripley, believe it or not, places? Yeah. I think I think that was there. Probably. And then maybe it moved to this antique place. Without a doubt, almost any vacation I went on and there was one there, I made someone take me. I mean, they're so fun. If they're all the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no new information to try to believe. <laughs> <laughs> Just, and I never you know, want to believe anything different. I want to go to all of them. Yes. They're all just validating each other. Yeah. In 1974, Jack Angel, a 66-year-old... A 66-year-old. <laughs> comma. <laughs> took a nap at his home in Savannah. Four days later, he started to notice burn marks on his body, but he was in no pain. Soon after, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital. His doctor found that Angel had an uh, had awful internal burns, so sadly uh-huh. that some of his nerves have been destroyed. And he, but he did ultimately survive. How? I mean, not how I, did he survive? I how don't know. He, There's there will be like those stories of like r- like spontaneous human combustion, and I wonder if it was something like the starts of that. I don't know. Spontaneous human combustion. Hmm. There's a story about it. I promise you. I promise. Was you, it by a scientist? Believe. I will punch you. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> so lucky you're far away. Yeah, it's like real. And there has been cases about it. Oh, Mary Reeser. Mary Reeser. That happened to her. BuzzFeed Unsolved True Crime actually covered it. Oh, I probably saw it then. You probably did. <laughs> Bish. <All right. sighs> How cool would it be if this became a show like BuzzFeed Unsolved? Oh, my God. That would be incredible. Obviously, it wouldn't be unsolved. But, I mean, how unique is it? We go around to all the states. We could travel and go to these places. Uh, And record from the places. I'd be scared shitless, but I would do it for a good amount of money. I would do it. I would would definitely do it for money. Do it. Yeah, I would do it. I would definitely do it for money. We should talk to BuzzFeed. (laughs) <laughs> there is a haunted pillar in Georgia that is rumored to be cursed. It is said that if you touch it, you will be doomed for life. It is said to have been cursed by an evangelicist. No, that's not how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> an evangelicist. Just, just, an an, an, an enemy. Evangelist. <laughs> oh, I had a too many syllables. <laughs> <You did. laughs> Can you say it again, please? <laughs> Here, you read the sentence, pause, I'll say the word, then we keep going. Okay. There we go. It is said to have been cursed by an evangelist who was mad when authorities forbid him from preaching there. Not long after that, a freak tornado torn through the town. A freak tornado torn. A tornado it torn. torn. <laughs> <laughs> a tor- it's still funny, a tornado tore. <gasps> no. That's not why it's called that. I'm going to look up some Greek and Latin roots later, and I can guarantee you there's going to be something about T-O-R. Actually, yeah, it probably does mean something like that. So I just think it's funny you give this gasp, and I know exactly what you're thinking. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, 20 years of friendship will do that to you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this freak tornado tore through the town, <laughs> but it left the oh, pillar really? intact, which is exactly <laughs> what the preacher said would happen. In the monastery district in Dublin is a portal. Apparently, this portal was created by geographer Eames Demetrios. 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 Oh, you motherfucker. (laughs) (laughs) Try your best. (laughs) I forgot that was in there. Asshole. (laughs) (sighs) And this portal is said to be able to connect us to another universe called Kakamarathaka. <laughs> Nailed it. Thank you. A man named Larry McElroy from Lee County shot an armadillo one day, but the bullet ended up ricocheting off the animal and hit his mother in law in the back. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> But have no fear. The 74-year-old mother-in-law was taken to the hospital and made a full recovery. What a story. Yeah, I mean, you could forever say, yeah, my son-in-law shot me in the back. Yeah. That would <laughs> suck. Damon Exum crashed his car into a patrol car in Dunwoody. This resulted in a slight case in which Exum was finally stopped. A slight what? chase? Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you read correctly, it makes more sense. <laughs> Okay, look, I'm going to really start pulling the dyslexia card again if I have to. And then you're going to make, you're going to. That's not dyslexia. That was you completely missing a letter. (sighs) Yeah. I didn't see the H. (laughs) Apparently. It wasn't there when I first looked. (laughs) It is now. (laughs) This resulted in a slight chase in which Exum was finally stopped. When asked for his license, instead of handing that over, Exhumed handed the officer a beer. <laughs> I really hope his name is Exhumed, and I was hoping that there would be an Exhumed joke in there, like Exhumed a body. No, unfortunately. No. no. Can I tell you that no. when I was driving to the Outer Banks, which is where I am currently, it took me through a lot of, like, back roads, back towns, small Ew. towns. Yeah, I was looking around and I had a few thoughts. I said, one, where do these people hang out? Right. Two, if my car, if something were to happen in this exact spot, it is daytime, but I would die. Yeah. I would die. If I pass a few other paces, I said, "Mm." and I was thinking if it's dark outside, like I'd be fucked. I would a hundred percent be kidnapped. This is, it was like, I could picture the beginning to the criminal minds episode (laughs) happening as I was driving. Then there was a couple other places I passed that I was like, something around here is definitely haunted. Oh, absolutely. I don't know what it is. There was like a couple of really, really small cemeteries that were like, seemed like their own. I don't know. It's just weird vibes. Ew. Weird vibes. I was a little nervous. Anyway. Yeah, I would be too. Um, grandmother Lulu Campbell had just dropped off her son when two robbers approached her vehicle. Wow, look at that. They held her at gunpoint while demanding money. One ended up shooting at her but missed. Well, Grandma Lulu was armed and shot back. Hell yeah, Grandma. Hitting Mm -hmm. the one robber in the chest. She then started firing at the other man who fled. Her truck sustained nine bullet holes and both front windows were busted out. But Grandma Lulu, she was okay. She is the owner of a convenience store, so she is always armed. I just thought that was so cool. I was like, that is grandma. And I will say, in a situation like that, glad she was armed. Although I did just see an article the other day about a woman who was shot because her husband had like flicked off a driver and he got mad and shot into the car and hit her. Yep. Which is why if someone I'm in the car with starts to get road rage, I'm like, stop. We don't know what they have in their car. It's not worth it. Yeah, I still get mad. I get mad to myself, but I don't get mad at, like, I don't show people that I'm mad because I don't want to get shot. Uh, right. But see, that's in that case, that's when I'm like, well, see, you shouldn't have a gun because if you're going to shoot me over driving. No, absolutely. People shouldn't have guns, but they do. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, mm. it's kind of like that in a circle thing where it's like, well, if you had a gun, you could protect yourself. It's like, yeah, but if you didn't have a gun, I wouldn't have to. <laughs> yep, Exactly. Um, yep. Strange, Stranger Things was filmed in Georgia. 
for all you Stranger Things fans out there. Me. Uh, I watched one episode. Yeah, it's good. Hmm. <laughs> the Girl Scouts program was born in Savannah in 1912. Was born, founded. Yeah, I didn't know another word. <laughs> founded. <laughs> Started. Eh. Established. Eh. I think the article I was reading used the word born, and I was like, that's a good word. No, not for that, that in there. Not. <laughs> <laughs> the phrase sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bed bugs bite was coined in Georgia. Georginian colonists would use spanish moss to bind their mattresses which would bring little creepy crawly bed bugs in interesting yeah um do you, do you remember in uh drama before a plays the tongue twisters we would do big black blood big black bugs be boo black blood but baby black blood yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> i lost my touch Big black bugs bleed blue black blood, but baby black bugs bleed blue. That was beautiful. Thank you. Don't ask me to say it faster because I can't. I would just <laughs> be making b b b sounds as we were Yeah. The Cherokee written alphabet was invented in Georgia. Very cool. Coca Cola was invented in Knoxville by Dr. John Pemberton. Wasn't that an accident? Like one of those, like, I think so. Like the chocolate chip cookie or the potato chip or whatever. Right. Yeah. Where the chocolate chip cookie was definitely an accident. I do remember reading okay. that. Yeah. But yeah, I think this might uh, be something the same. Yeah. Kanye West, Ludacris, and Childish Gambino are all from Atlanta. Martin Luther King Jr. Did you know him and I have the same initials minus the junior part? Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was also born in Atlanta. Hulk Hogan was born in Terry Jean Belia. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, there are quite a few serial killers from Georgia. You have Joseph Dewey Atkin. I don't know who that is. I don't either. I didn't know who any of them were. <laughs> oh, well, good to know for when we come back to Georgia. Oh, exactly. Joseph Dewey Akin was born in Mar Marita, Maretta, Mary Marietta, Marietta, Carlton Gary was born in Columbus. Wayne Williams was born in Southwest Atlanta, and he's known for the Atlanta child martyrs. I think I do know I, that. I do know that one. Yeah. So uh, what's your story, Morning Glory? <laughs> Everyone, you have to tell us which ones you like the most. <laughs> this is the first one. <laughs> if you one. Have anything else that rhymes with like what you talking about what's up like tell me what's cooking good looking but you know it's a story so there wouldn't be anything cooking well instead of tell me something i'm gonna put it on there anyway let's i have a list i started oh i love that what's cooking good looking all right so what's your story morning glory <laughs> i like that one i like that one <laughs> okay so the setting for this tale takes us to the 1970s so 1970s, especially Georgia during this time, was not a very friendly or accepting kind of thing, open-minded place. Satanic it is panic now? Was in... No, no, but it was even <laughs> worse in the 70s. That's what I thought. Satanic panic was in its infancy. Parents were just starting to worry about different things going on in their children's lives that could make them susceptible to Satan's power and whatnot. Satanic panic wouldn't hit its true high until the 80s, though, when it really started to run rampant. The 70s were also a time when drugs were commonplace and more so accepted, but homosexuality was not. So now to the case. I'm back in time. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Charles Scudder came from a wealthy family. He was born on October 6, 1926 in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, uh -huh, to parents Charles Morrison Sutter and Eleanor Edith Lee. Charles grew up to be a pretty smart guy. As an undergrad, he studied language and zoology languages and zoology after that he earned his phd in pharmacology we are not going into any debates about him <laughs> I, I kept my mouth shut. i didn't even go down that route i, I just had to establish a baseline i was like my thought process was wow he knows a lot about animals <laughs> <laughs> like that was the thought that went through my head <laughs> 
So not long after graduating, he was hired as an associate professor of pharmacology by Loyola University in Chicago. His colleagues often described him as brilliant. Others who knew him described him as polished and soft-spoken but confident. He was also the assistant director of the Institute of the Study of Mind, Drugs, and Behavior. That is something that if they need test subjects, I will happily participate. You would have loved this. So he believed in the unity of the universe and published the results of his many different experiments that he did on this topic. Oh my God, so, is it my soulmate? Well, I'll get to why not. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably going to be a bad guy. No, we love Charles. Oh, goody. Yay. We love Charles. Well, I like Charles. He was problematic to some, but I liked him. <laughs> From you know, what I learned so about him. so apparently what he studied at this institute he supposedly performed government funded experiments with mind altering drugs like lsd okay pause because serious note uh if you haven't already you should watch um psychedelics on netflix because it talks about the different like shrooms lsd (gasps) even like some of the other heavier ones and oh my god please remind me of this yeah, and it it interviews people who had crippling mental health, whether it was depression, PTSD, um, anxiety, you name it, these people had it. And they talked about how nothing worked, they tried everything, and so they obviously anything that they did was in was was within the control of a doctor. It's not like they were just right. doing it really nilly. Right. But the the things that they said for like mm-hmm. how it really, really helped them and that they like felt like this whole new person because I I remember distinctively like I watched it and hearing hearing them it was like I, ca- I like I had this thought of like okay so I can get better like I don't have to be Aww. anxious all the time I might not do that but <laughs> if whatever but plan I have out there right if if the path I'm on right now stops working or whatever then maybe that's one that I can try Wow, what a nice spin on a show about, you know, psychedelics and things. I cried a little bit because I was like, wow, they get better. (laughs) They got better. So I I highly recommend it. It's very, very, it's just interesting too to hear about it. Oh, that stuff is so interesting. And I really think it like, it really puts a human light onto mental health because it's Mm -hmm. your everyday Joe Schmoes. It's like, You know, yes, they have veterans, obviously, for the PTSD aspect. Right. But they also have all sorts of other people from all sorts of walks of life. So I really think they did a good job of, like, including a variety of situations and showing that different kinds of things can work for people. Dang, well, I'll take a look at that. Okay. But so on the kind of darker side of all of that. (laughs) (laughs) The point of this show. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. The mind altering drugs and the LSD and stuff kind of made me think of MK Ultra. I don't know who so, that is. So it's not a who, it's a what. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> so I have a Wikipedia definition for you. Thank you. So it describes it as quote, an illegal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the US Central Intelligence Agency and intended to develop procedures and identify drugs that could be used during interrogations to weaken people and force confessions through brainwashing and psychological torture. It began in 1953 and was halted in 1973. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate its subjects' mental states and brain functions, such as the covert admis- administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs, especially LSD, and other chemicals without the subject's consent, electroshocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other forms of torture. Oh, so I don't think he was doing anything bad like that. Like that but when it said the whole like government funded experiment that dealt with LSD, I was like, MK Ultra. Like there are a ton of podcasts who have talked about it, which is when I heard it for the first time was through one of the podcasts I listened to. And I was like, holy shit, like what is that? Roy's starting to pace, so I don't know what's happening. He's been acting extra. I don't know why I fucking looked out the window. <laughs> <laughs> As if that would give you your answer. <laughs> But so we're not talking about MK Ultra today, but it was just an interesting side fact that I like kind of thought of. 
So Charles is known as being very eccentric. His colleagues said that sometimes he would show up to work with dyed purple or red hair. And even at times he had a pet monkey. Hmm. But all wasn't how it seemed with Charles. He was starting to get worn down by his job. He said that the medical students were growing increasingly more unruly and were less interested in learning. The standards at the, mm, the standards, hear that. Right, right. <laughs> the standards at the school he taught at had dropped and the entire department became, quote, a hotbed of office politics, backbiting and resentment. Are you sure and we're not soulmates? I will in like five bullet points. You'll find out why we were not why you are not soulmates. <laughs> All right. We're going through some similar shit, man. I know. You really are, actually. (laughs) We've had our hair dyed purple. Work has been not great. Our students are losing interest in learning. Like, a lot of parallels here. Very eccentric. Very eccentric. (laughs) Wild. And things weren't going too well at home either. His second marriage wasn't working out, so his wife moved out of their shared Chicago West Side mansion. His children were also all grown and had already moved out as well. He was left alone in his mansion with no one but himself and his longtime housekeeper and companion, Joseph Odom. Hmm. So Joseph was 12 years younger than Charles, having been born on March 27th, 1938. He only had a fifth grade education and had been on the wrong side of the law for a bit, but he had found steady employment working for Charles. For 17 years, Joseph worked for Charles and his family, cooking for the family and helping take care of and care for the mansion. Uh, Charles once said about Joseph, quote, he learned far more about the world than I had with all of my degrees. And somewhere along the way, he developed a talent for whipping up meals fit for a king. Aww. So in 1976, Charles's mother passed away and left him with a pretty modest inheritance, which Charles mentioned was about $100 a month, which in today's money would be about $534, which doesn't seem like a lot of money per month. So I don't really know, but he said it was enough, you know. Hmm. And he took this money as a ticket to his new life. He'd been growing increasingly more unhappy with the current life he was living. He was apathetic towards everything and was finding very little joy in his surroundings. He hated the bills he had to pay. He was growing increasingly unhappy with his job, and he didn't want to live in the city anymore. With this money, he could move away from the city, leave his job at the university, and start a new, happier life. Okay. So this prompted his search to find where he wanted to go. He wanted to still experience the four seasons in some hilly country, but without super cold winters. So I totally understand that. Okay, you know what, Lauren? I don't understand at what point you're going to make this case for him not being my soulmate, because honestly, it kind of sounds like me in a past life. (laughs) It actually kind of does. So he (laughs) he wanted a place, quote, with a good supply of pure water and wood for heating and cooking, and most important, with a measure of isolation. Mm -hmm. And. With that, he got to work studying geological survey maps of southern states and wrote to local realty boards. One of those letters was answered when one person told Charles that there was an inexpensive 40-acre plot of hardwood trees in the Appalachian foothills in North Georgia, Chattooga County. God bless you. (laughs) That area was completely surrounded by the Chattahoochee National Forest. <laughs> I knew, I knew it was coming. I was like, right when I typed that word, I was like, Q McKenzie singing. <laughs> okay, this is even more things for you. So he made the 10 hour drive down to scout the property. And when he did, he was floored. So he just does a typical t- like 10 hour drive. You do your casual 10 hour drive. 16. You know, rounding up or down. <laughs> Whatever. I, I need to calculate how much I've driven between you really should all the places i've gone you've just had like a really fun little month uh yeah it's been nice although i was driving to the hotel today and and it's probably because i had such a short trip visiting my friend grace and then i had to turn around and drive another seven hours oh god but i'm like i i kind of want to go home yeah i i and that because usually when you drive for that long it's because you're going home yeah or you're going to a hotel where you just started your trip so you're ready for the trip you know right and so I feel like probably by the time that I meet up with my friend and her family and we're staying at a house for a week (laughs) and I can feel settled it'll feel better yes absolutely I'm really looking forward to going home I bet so Okay, so he gets to this property. When he gets there, he just realizes it is beautiful nature, a ton of wildlife, serene, just kind of everything he had been looking for. So on his 50th birthday, October 6th, 1976, he celebrated by sending his resignation letter to Loyola University. All right. 
I know, like a great 50th birthday. His next step was to start liquidating his house and his assets. This means he pretty much started selling things to get the most money he could out of his property. And remember, he lived in a mansion, so he had a lot of stuff to go through and a lot of stuff to get rid of. He auctioned off his furniture and sold off everything that had a plug, as his new house would have no electricity. Ooh, starting to not see eye to eye anymore. Yeah, just the way that his housekeeper Joseph liked it. Charles once said that Joseph would typically, like, he would tie up all of the cords of any appliance that had cords because he didn't like using them. So he was the person who preferred the wood-burning stoves, the hot plates, like, things that didn't need electricity and kind of were, like, back-to-nature kind of things. Okay. All that Charles kept were a few of his prized possessions to include a golden harp as well as those essential things that are needed for survival. So just a side note, he was a talented harp player. At one point, he had been invited to play with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Oh, shit. Yeah. So he this, was is, like, this is the housekeeper, right? No, that's Charles, the man who owns the house. Oh. Joseph is the cook. Charles was the harp pharmacy person. Who have, who have we been talking about? Charles. Okay. I've mentioned Joseph like once or twice. Charles is who you think your soulmate is. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Woo! (laughs) Carry on. (laughs) He sold his house within weeks, and with that, Charles had disconnected with his life in Chicago and was ready to start his new life in Georgia. Was he taking Joe? Well, Charles wouldn't be going alone. With him, he would be traveling to Georgia to build his new home brick by brick with Joseph Odom by his side. This is why you would not be compatible, because if you haven't surmised by now, Charles and Joseph are together. Uh, Yes, I figured, but it just shows we have more in common since we are both interested in men. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. (laughs) So... (laughs) (laughs) now that everything is sold he said that he and joseph left for their kingdom so they were going down to georgia to build their life together but their journey to this new life started off kind of rough joseph charles and their two english mastiffs had piled into a car and started the 10-hour trek to arrive at their new property and those english mastiffs are like huge huge yeah so the the drive had been less than ideal as they were traveling through a blizzard that had absolutely pounded the american midwest and south They got lost multiple times, and when they finally arrived in the area the property was, they were unable to find it and had to park the car and spend the night in their car. Oh. They finally arrived to their new property, but the storm was still going and was only getting worse. The road they took to get to their property, Dead Horse Road, was completely obstructed from view. They were essentially alone and stranded in the wilderness, having to melt snow to have water. Because remember, they are- They wanted. Yeah, but they bought a property. They didn't buy a house. So they have the property, right. So they're chilling in their car right now because they don't have a house. They don't have a house. Okay. Yes. But finally the snow melted and they were able to get to work building what would eventually be their dream home. They bought all the necessary tools they would need to build a house by hand. They cleared the land, dug a well, and started to excavate, excavate the foundation for the structure all by hand using a chainsaw, a concrete mixer, and a garden cultivator. Good for them. I know. When summer rolled around, the first floor was livable. It consisted of the kitchen, dining room, and living room. It was all brick and had a castle-like structure. Later, the Atlanta Constitution, which is a news website, would describe that it had been built using, quote, medieval building techniques, and that, quote, there are no square corners in the whole place. Isn't that the start of a riddle? Yeah, it was like someone dies in a roundhouse who was the killer and you're like the maid said that she was cleaning the corners the gardener said he was out hoeing the lawn or whatever and it's the maid because there are no corners because it's a circular house right yeah <laughs> so, so the yes. second yes it is <laughs> to answer your question in shortness <laughs> uh, you always make so me this- feel so validated <laughs> That's what I do. (laughs) So the second year, they built the second floor, which had two bedrooms and a circular staircase to get up there, which is awesome. I love our spiral staircases. Mm -hmm. It was illuminated by stained glass windows that Charles had made on his own. Wow, that's impressive. Right. So along with stained glass, he like the stained glass he made, he also painted. One of his main prominent paintings was a self-portrait. Okay. The picture depicted him with a gag in his mouth. And what looked like five bullet holes in his head. 
yeah very odd and it's just like hanging up in their house yeah Hmm. so let's talk about the place that the two built okay right above the main entrance standing watch was a pink concrete gargoyle oh i can see where this is going where just keep talking (laughs) okay (laughs) and so like i said he made the stained glass windows that were around the house but they weren't Mm -hmm. your typical stained glass depicting angels or landscapes or whatnot i didn't imagine it actually Mm. one depicted a human skull let me guess okay there's two stained glass that i'm going to talk about okay one you said looks like a human skull but is there more to it depicted a human skull no no just a human skull okay the second one is it of this earth no Mm. is it a monster yeah does it have hair Uh uh-huh it's like scary 20 questions (laughs) (laughs) is it a werewolf no is it well what the fuck else is hairy so the other depicted baphomet what the fuck is that this is the demonic goat-headed deity that serves as the official symbol for the church of satan oh that guy (laughs) yep that one Mm. Hmm. you know harry not from this world i'm trying to hold on to all of these details Yes, there's a lot. Okay, so a little about the church. And I apologize if I get any of this wrong. This is information that I found on websites in my research. I'm not a member of this church, so I could be getting this information wrong. But this is what I found doing my research, so I tried my best to make it as accurate as possible. Okay. So the church was founded less than a decade before Charles had moved to Georgia by a man named Anton LaVey. It was relatively new as religions go, and it had a small following, but a very dedicated one. What was it called again? The Church of Satan. Oh, okay. Yeah. So members don't necessarily necessarily believe in an actual entity named Satan, but rather they believe the notion of Satan that Christians have rallied around. And as for Charles, he was an atheist, so he didn't worship Satan. He chose to celebrate the worldly pleasure that he felt were denied by other Abrahamic religions. I don't know. I don't know really what that means. So, you know how, like, some religions, you can't have sex before marriage. You shouldn't be drunk. You shouldn't do drugs. Those are Abrahamic religions, which are, like, Christianity, um, Islam, like, kind of those are the Abrahamic religions, Judaism. Um, He wanted to be able to do what he wanted and experience the pleasures of the world. So he didn't want to be a part of that? No. So that's why he's an atheist. And so the Church of Satan, a lot of, at least from my research, a lot of members of the Church of Satan are atheists. Oh. It's not that they necessarily worship Satan. It's more they call themselves the Church of Satan because it goes against Christianity. Oh, so it's an ironic thing. Yes. Got it. Yep. yep. So it's like a slap in the face to Christians because it's like, look at this Church of Satan. They're not worshiping Satan. They're just doing things that Christians don't think is good. Pretty much what i believe if i'm wrong i really do apologize let us know if we're wrong but that's what i gathered in my research so it's unclear why he joined in the first place but joseph said that he that charles joined because he was curious about what it was and wanted to check it out but either way charles was an official member of the organization and the church and this next thing i read in only one place so i can't say how accurate it is but allegedly anton levey the founder of satanism the church of satan and charles were friends Ooh. It was even rumored that LeVay had visited the manor on occasion. The manor? But, oh, yes. I will get to what this place is called in a second. Okay. But there's actually no evidence that he ever visited, and more so he even denied visiting the property. But he and Charles were at least friendly, would exchange letters. Like, you know, good terms. Yeah. And like I said, Charles and Joseph had two English mastiffs. Do you want to guess their names? Sure. Okay. Um, Male, female, or could be both? Uh, I think they're both male. Okay. Do their names, are their names stereotypical male names or is it more of a fluid? Uh, Stereotypical, I would say. Okay. Is it like human? No. No. So not like how I had Jimmy or you had Roy. No. Did you, um, (laughs) did you notice that the doggy? On the state first post, his collar says Roy. <gasps> no! Oh my god! Yeah. Oh look, that's so cute. 
There's a little ghost oh, doggy, what? and I oh. put the little thing on, and it says Roy. Oh, oh my god! After we get off, I will go go look. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah, not human names. So what do you? Okay. What do you? Guess? Lucifer. Okay. Good guess, but no, but very good guess. I can't think of any of his other names. You're literally not going to guess the second name because it's a name I've never heard of. But one but of I them I guess- absolutely have heard of. Okay. Um, Satan? No. Mm, Angel of Death? Um, You're getting close. So the first one was named Beelzebub. What? Beelzebub. Beelzebub? Yes. Who in Satanism and in mythology is the Lord of Darkness. Oh. Queen actually sings about it in um, Bohemian Rhapsody. I can't understand what the hell they're saying. I think we've talked about this before. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) But so that's one of the dog's names. The other was named Arsenath, which is an H.P. Lovecraft character. Who? H.P. Lovecraft. I've talked to you about him before. He does like the whole like mythology kind of character-y scary books. Oh. Yes. Like creatures and stuff. But Ah. so those are two names. Beelzebub and Arsenath. Okay, that's His- too many syllables. <laughs> Roy. <laughs> well, because they say that you're not supposed to have your pet's name be more than two syllables because it's too long. It's too much. I get they that. Won't- they won't know. I get Although, it. Although, James had many names. Oh, yeah. Roy has like 900. Right. So, sorry. Continue. <laughs> So apparently his dog protected their house and local legend said that they also had summoned a real demon to assist the dogs in guarding the house. I mean, yeah. If you're already going down that path, you might as well just go in head first. Yep. So back to the house. The property also had a mysterious abundance of dead or dying trees, leading Charles to name the property Corpsewood Manor. I like that. So that's where we get the manor and yep, Corpsewood. I like that. But the house also had healthy vegetation. They had a rose garden, fruit trees, a vegetable garden, and even a brick gazebo that overlooked the gardens. Charles Ooh. said that this is where he and Joseph would take tea. Oh, I, I just guess I love them. They just, oh. And I love Charles loved, I know, oh, I do too. And Charles loved this new life he was living. He wrote an article about the building on his new home titled A Castle in the Country, which he posted, well, it's now posted in Mother Earth News, which is online, A Guide to Living Mm -hmm. Wisely. I guess back then it was probably like a newspaper. He would talk about the peace and happiness that he and Joseph experienced here. They had no bills. Well, very few. They owed no one anything. They got to live in the country and in nature together. One of the excerpts from his article said, quote, This morning, for example, I picked fresh raspberries to go along with our whole wheat pancakes. We grind our own flour from wheat that we buy for $7 per 100 pounds, and honey from our beehive served as syrup. Then I weeded, pumped water, and went about my other chores. At 10 a.m., we had tea in the gazebo, and I designed a new chicken house that I plan to start building soon. Tonight, I may practice my harp, or perhaps I'll sit in the courtyard and listen to the tree frogs and whippoorwills, while bats fly and and the clouds drift across the full moon. Uh, the world that's around me now is fresh, quiet, and very beautiful. Oh, my God. That's like the original Facebook status. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Let me tell you. <laughs> that sounds so lovely. I know. So you could just tell he was very happy with this new life he was living. He said that in two short years, they were living in an elegant mini castle. So about the chicken house that he was designing. It ended up being a three-story wooden structure that housed the chickens and their food. Damn. That wasn't all this house held. Uh-oh. On, <laughs> on the third floor of the structure was the pink room. Oh, no. So up to the third floor, there was a ladder that led to a narrow wooden opening. This was the opening to a single room painted pink. It was furnished with some gas lamps, a few old mattresses, and a huge collection of porn. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we got a sex room. <laughs> It was considered a above personal- the chickens, right? Like, ugh. <laughs> ugh. so it was considered a personal pleasure chamber. All right. And many nights after the couple was done hosting guests, most evenings would continue in the pink room. Damn. Participant, uh, yeah, have some nice food and wine, and then come have sex. But it sounds fine Twist because my partic- arm. <laughs> I mean, it was the seventies. 
<laughs> exactly. Participants said that everything that went on in the room was consensual, free of judgment, and fueled by homemade wine that Charles and Joseph made from the grapes they had on their property. I love that. I know. And I love how it's like consensual. Everyone's agreeing yeah. to it. No one felt judged. It just feels like a very safe a very environment. safe. Yes. Yes. A journal was also there so that guests could talk about their preferences and their experiences and other things that went on in the room. I love that. I know. And though the two came to town in this secluded area to get away from the city and the judgment and the stress, that isn't necessarily what they got. So they still so. had to go into town to stock up on supplies and get the occasional things they needed. But rumors and talk started to spread about the two men who lived in a castle on the hill. They oh, soon earned no. the reputation of new to town strangers who dressed like hippies and had to be Satanists as they drove, get this, a black Jeep that had pentagrams painted on the sides. Ooh, e. Mm hmm. Not the best idea. No. In rural Georgia. Yes. Not at all. <laughs> so Ooh. the nearest town of Tryon, Trion, was the main place where Joseph and Charles would come to shop, walk around, kind of all that. But it was a very conservative place. We're talking about Georgia in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Stories of gay devil worshippers who hosted elaborate sex parties in their hidden castle in the woods spread throughout the community. Well, they're half right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and while some were outraged that this was happening in their good old community, others were curious. Curious As townspeople started... Be. Right. So those curious people started to make the drive up Mountain View Road to take a peek at these new neighbors, their castle on the hill, and especially their greeting sign. The sign said, beware of the thing. Most likely... <laughs> I love these guys so much. People believe it's most likely an Adams Family reference. Oh my god. The I, Like, I can just imagine, like, I can just picture it. And... Not, you know, the losers from back then, but like, I just imagine like walking up there and like, it seems daunting. You don't know what to expect, but then you're just like, the doors open up and you're welcomed into this home. And it's just these two lovely men who have mm -hmm. this eccentric taste and are truly themselves and are welcoming and loving and bring you in and just make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. You are not wrong about them. Okay. And I will get to that soon. But, of course, rumors continue to swirl from those who actually did visit. Some said that Charles had summoned a demon to guard his property, while others said that they saw robed figures in the woods holding seances. Oh, and Lordy. this this is about the time that satanic panic was really starting to increase around the country, so that wasn't helping at all. So fast forward a bit to 1982. Charles and Joseph had been living in Georgia for about five years at this point. And like I said, satanic panic full force the exorcist had just come that had just come out which introduced audiences to a terrifying demon in possession the mm. poltergeist had come out that year dungeons and dragons was popular scaring parents and having them fear that their children will fall under demonic spell for playing yeah oh. we covered a case in washington that talked about that talked about what uh it was a whole thing that dealt with dungeons and dragons and two a couple was killed after they left a game um a dungeons and dragons playing game in the 80s oh damn yeah Fuck, I just had a thought. Nope, it's gone. Continue. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, if it comes back. No, it's okay. no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> a conspiracy theory a few years prior in 1978 claimed that McDonald's, like the double golden arches, was funding mm -hmm. satanic enterprises. <sighs> Get a hobby. This theory. Find I know. something to do to occupy your time that is productive and healthy. Uh, seriously, <laughs> this theory actually gained so much popularity that the founder, Roy Kroc, had to make a public announcement addressing the theory, claiming that it was false and that he was a, quote, God-fearing, God-loving man. My eyes could not roll further back into my head. Oh, I know. And Michelle Smith released a best-selling book called Michelle Remembers. Oh, my this God. This book talks about satanic ritual abuse, a new term that freaked out so many people. She told her story about how she Oh, I remember captured. what I was going to say. What? Because <laughs> you were talking about how kids were scaring their parents. And I was a little shit. And so I thought it was hilarious to scare the crap out of my mom. Oh, my God. Which I think come full circle and I get startled at everything. 
yeah, it was the universe being like, you want to do that to someone? Just you wait. Yeah, like I got out of the elevator today and there was a person standing there. And it wasn't so much the person that startled me, but like her daughter kind of like squealed for a second. (laughs) and It made me jump. (laughs) And it's so it happened so fast that I'm like, oh, maybe nobody saw. (laughs) Did they apologize? No. Then maybe they didn't see. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. (laughs) So back to this Michelle Smith. So she told a story about how she was captured by a satanic cult, then was caged, tortured, and sexually molested by different members of the cult. Oh, my God. Her tale would eventually be debunked, but at the time, this sent the country into a panic. Oh, shit. And another panic that was happening around this time was gay panic. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's the 80s. That checks out. Uh Uh-huh. In Atlanta around this time, several local black children and young men were being killed by a serial killer, and Atlanta was obviously terrified. Oh, is this the, um, what's his name? I think so. Atlanta Child Murders. Yeah, yeah. Williams. I don't, yeah, something Williams. But yeah, mm-hmm. I don't I don't talk about that. But mm-hmm. one of the reasons I bring it up is that during the manhunt for the monster responsible, one theory started to circulate. The theory was that, and this is, it's just so awful. It was that a ring of homosexual pedophiles were responsible for the murders. There was also a terrifying new, quote, gay disease going around. I am obviously referring to HIV and AIDS, which was first identified in 1981. The gay disease is what the news and media were calling it. So the news each night would have some mention of either HIV, AIDS, or Satan. Not that I was there, but I just feel so bad. And I know, I know, like, you know, you look back on all the history that you learn and how people were treated. And of course, you have this sympathy and you have this, like, that's terrible. We shouldn't do that. I'm glad we don't. But then you get older and you realize, oh, fuck, we kind of still do. We absolutely and still do. It's just ridiculous. We're still fighting for rights for everyone. Of course, we still have this yeah. going on. I just feel like you have that childhood bubble of like, you this do. was in the past and this isn't happening anymore. I and mean, everything's all hunky-dory. And then it's burst at some point earlier mm-hmm. for some than for others. And it's just sad that like you're talking about something that happened in the past, which one is not that long ago. Right. Both of our parents were alive then. And two- yep. The fact that it's still happening now, you're just like, (sighs) anyway, continue. I know. I know. I could stand on my soapbox forever. Oh, yeah. We absolutely could. So this absolutely (laughs) didn't bode too well for our two hippie Satanists, two Mm. men living together alone in the woods who had all the signs of Satanism clearly displayed around their property. Mm. And of course, suspicion and fear fell on Corpsewood Manor and the two men living there. And by now, more and more people were taking the trip to Corpsewood Manor to witness this gay Satanist, the two things you could possibly... The two worst things you could possibly be at this time. So everyone had the same thought that these men were evil and would be dangerous to be encountered. That couldn't be more different, and all of those curious, hesitant visitors would soon notice that. When Joseph and Charles saw a random visitor on their property, they would invite them in for dinner and some homemade wine. (laughs) And locals started to realize that they weren't scary, crazy men, but rather really hospitable hosts. This allowed the two men to become very friendly with the locals and seen as just two great guys leading to Corpsewood Manor becoming a sort of social hangout destination. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. So Joseph, who I mentioned, was a great cook. He would whip up incredible meals for their visitors from their own garden, while Charles would entertain entertain and host, usually playing the golden harp of his. Love that. A year later, Candy Grogan gave an interview to the Chicago Tribune. Grogan was one of Charles' closest friends and described a candle at dinner she had enjoyed at the manor. It featured a five-course meal, and the wine was served in silver goblets. Quote, it was a fantasy, she had said. Oh, I love that. Uh, It's going to get so sad. I know. (laughs) Can't we just end here? I'm like waiting. I'm this whole time. I'm like, the shoe's going to drop. I'm waiting for it. And in 1982, the year we are still in is when shit goes down and that shoe drops. Oh, God. So enter a new character, 17-year-old Kenneth Avery Brock. Brock was from nearby Walker County, was an avid hunter. His father was abusive and ended up kicking Brock out of their home at a young age. Brock eventually found Charles, who, knowing he was a hunter, happily granted him permission to hunt on the property. Okay. They started to form a close friendship, so Brock, Joseph, and Charles, and he would visit Corpsewood Manor often. It is rumored that Brock even joined them in the pink room on occasion. Okay, go ahead, Brock. Okay. 
And then we have another person introduced at this point. 30-year-old Samuel Tony West, Brock's friend and roommate. Uh-oh. So the first red flag we have about Tony West here is that his roommate is a 17-year-old kid. So they have a 13-year age difference, which is just weird. Wait, wait, okay. wait. hold on. Got to get my characters in order. Okay. You have Brock is how old? 17. Ooh. West is and- 30. Yeah, but they're inviting a 17-year-old into the pink room? It's the 70s. But it was all consensual, so maybe age of consent was different then. Maybe. It was never forced, at least. So if Brock's doing it, he's doing it on his own volition, which, I mean, it's still young, but he is 17, so he's making these choices on his own. Right, and it's not like they brought him in for that reason. Right, like, they became friends, they were hunting on the property, it came up that they had this pink room, Brock would join. Got it. So we have West. West is older, meaning he had some history and that history wasn't great. So first off, when he was 13 years old, he had been playing with a loaded gun. This led to a tragic accident where he accidentally shot and killed his two-year-old nephew. Ugh. So this incident really, really messed him up. I can imagine. Right. So throughout his younger years, so teens into early 20s, he bounced between different jails and mental institutions. By the age of 30, he had a violent felony record. So one day, these two just wastes of human beings were in the trailer that they shared and were talking about Corpsewood Manor, so Brock and West. Brock had been going there often and was telling West that based on all they had there, how they built their own house, how they had lounged around all day, Joseph and Charles were obviously pretty wealthy and were hiding a lot of the riches in this manor of theirs. Mm. That got the two of them thinking that they wanted that money. And they began to devise a plan where they would ambush the two and rob them blind. Oh, my God. And on December 12th, 1982. They take you in. They let you into their home. They let you hunt onto their property. They bring you into a very intimate space. And you're going to backstab them? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Bruh. So on December 12th, 1982, Brock and West were ready to finally execute their plan. They had been hanging out with two friends, Joey Wells, who was a relative of either Brock or West, I can't remember, and Joey's date, Mm -hmm. Teresa Hutchins. So it's Brock, West, Joey Wells, and Teresa Hutchins. Brock and West invited the other two along, saying that they were planning on heading up to Corpsewood Manor to drink and do some drugs. They're all underage, so having a place where they could actually drink and do drugs was huge for them. So Wells and Hutchins agreed, and excitedly, they all loaded into West's car, West's car, and began making their way to Corpsewood Manor. Now, at this point, only Brock and West were aware of the plan. Okay. The other two thought they were just going to get high and drunk together. Okay. On the way, though, they started huffing toodaloo. What? This is a concoction of alcohol, paint thinner, and glue that provides a cheap high. So you're huffing all these fumes. You get slightly high. Oh. Yes. So the four are feeling pretty good when they arrive at the manor. They make their way over to the building where the pink room is, climbed up the ladder, and were all greeted by Charles. Brock had brought a can of Toodaloo with him, so the four and Charles partook. Joseph was in the house at the time, cleaning up from the dinner that he and Charles had just enjoyed together. The group of now five chatted for a bit up in the pink room, doing the Toodaloo stuff and just talking and hanging out. After a few minutes, Brock excused himself and said that he needed to run back out to the car to grab more Toodaloo. He disappeared down the ladder and made his way back to the car. But instead of grabbing more drugs, he pulled out the rifle he had put in the truck, marking the start of their plan. He made his way back up the ladder, and with this, West also knew that the plan was in motion. (laughs) It just makes me so sad. Okay. Charles saw the gun when Brock brought it back into the room. In a sort of way to diffuse the tension and the obvious nervousness, he felt around the gun. He jokingly said, bang, bang. And I see it as kind of like being like, oh, bang, bang. Like, you know, like jokingly, like, okay, that's kind of scaring me, but like, maybe this is just fine. Brock handed his gun to West pulled a knife from his boot, and lunged towards Charles, grabbing him by the hair and pressing the knife against his neck. This is when he started to interrogate Charles about his riches and his hidden fortune and demanded that he hand over any money. Charles calmly explained that they don't keep cash on the property, they keep everything they have in a bank, and that even then, they didn't have a ton of money. Everything they had, they put into the house, and not much was left. Yeah. Not not satisfied with this answer, Brock let go of Charles, descended the ladder, and went into the house to find Joseph. Hmm. Not long after he was out of sight, the sound of gunshots rang out. Ugh. Oh. 
Brock had fired point blank at Joseph and the couple's two dogs who were sleeping by the <gasps> stove. <laughs> I, I know, killing all of them instantly. I know, it's so bad. Oh, upon hearing the shots, Wes jumped into the next part of the plan. As he was binding Charles, the two friends who had come along, Wells and Hudgens, were terrified. They tore down the ladder and sprinted over to the car they had arrived in. But to their absolute horror, they couldn't get the car to turn over. And by that point, West was already to them, forcing them back up into the pink room. <sighs> when he was sure he had everyone under control, he forced the three down the ladder and back into the manor. Inside the manor, and once again, they demanded that Charles reveal where the money was hidden. Torn apart and overwhelmed by the sight of all the things that Charles held most dear dead, he pulled away from Brock and West and made a run for Joseph. But another gunshot rang out and Charles fell to the floor. West walked right up to him and shot him execution style five times in the head. Oh my god. It is it is rumored that his last words were, quote, I asked for this. Oh no, you didn't. But could this be from the self-portrait he painted? Where he was (gasps) gagged and shot five times in the head? Isn't that freaky? Oh, I I just got chills. <laughs> I, know. I know. So I some people totally believe maybe forgot he forgot about it. that. Yeah. <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> so some people think maybe he predicted his own death or was like somehow able to foresee like this like premonition of what was gonna happen to him. So I know. Ooh. Reading it out sa- out loud, it is so much sadder than when I was typing it. <laughs> yeah. So with the two owners now dead, West and Brock had free reign of the house and began searching it for the hidden treasure, completely ransacking it in the process. When their search was unsuccessful and yielded zero results, like they tried to say, the two grabbed several little items, a handful of nickels and dimes, bits of jewelry, a silver candelabra, and a gold-plated dagger, and threw them into Charles's Jeep. They also grabbed mm-hmm. his prized golden harp. But they were stupid and soon realized that harps are big and couldn't fit in the truck, so they ended up leaving it behind. Then the four loaded up into the two cars, so West's car and Charles's truck, and drove back to Brock and West's trailer. So they also stole his Jeep. Mm-hmm. When there, Brock and uh, West threatened Wells and Hudgens, saying that if they told anyone, they would be killed too. So back over at Corpsewood, four days after everything, a friend in Charles and Joseph, Raymond Williams, decided to stop by Corpsewood Manor for a visit and to inform them that a friend of theirs had sadly passed away. Oh, As he approached the front door... Of- <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad. So as he approached the front door of the manor, he noticed bullet holes. Williams raced back into town to notify the authorities. Within an hour, Corpsewood was swarming with deputies from the Chat- Chattooga County Sheriff's Office. Upon entering the home, they were all exposed to a gruesome scene before them. The place was a complete mess. Furniture was overturned, blood was spattered and stained the walls, and bullet casings were on the floor. Sheriff Gary McConnell, we don't like him. He phoned the Georgia Bureau of Investigations as well as the state crime lab. Now remember, these two were into Satanism and the occult and all that sort of thing. Oh my god! So you can imagine the shock that the investigators got when they walked into Corpsewood Manor, other than the crime scene, of course. I'm mad and you they- haven't even told me what I should be mad about yet, but I'm already fucking mad. <laughs> in the manor, they found satanic statues, paintings, and artwork that self-portrait included, chains and whips, a woman's wig, porn, actual human skulls, and vials of LSD. Apparently, 12,000 doses of LSD. Damn. <laughs> oh, holy shit. <laughs> Apparently, it was noted later that Charles actually got the LSD and skulls from his lab at Loyola. Loyola. That's fucking hilarious okay this is the part that's gonna get you pissed okay this sheriff mcconnell Mm -hmm. actually tried to bring charges against the two dead victims for odd behavior after seeing everything in their house you're fucking kidding me but he couldn't due to freedom of religion they have been murdered they're the victims of murder and you're trying to charge them with something I'm fucking sorry, what? It's just the times were so awful. They and still like what, are, but they were so awful. And like, what's crazy is that it's like, you could easily see that. I could see that happening now. And like, what's also so sad is like, they weren't hurting anyone. No, they were so nice. They were doing their own thing. They were very, very nice people who weren't hurting anyone. And, like, the locals knew that. And 
Yes, I can imagine that on snap judgment, walking into a situation where you see this brutal murder and you see these things that you're not used to seeing in a typical home, I can understand is shocking. But to then just make these assumptions about these people and to victim blame, no, you know, like, and to say that anyone would deserve that one way or another, because clearly he thinks that if he's, oh, absolutely, he thinks that you know, charged after death. It's like you have that much hate in your heart for something Mm -hmm. that's different and not, they didn't put it on anybody. They never made anyone do anything that they didn't want to do. Yep. And anyone who came to visit them was pure, it was visiting. It wasn't because they're going to, to, it's not like a cult. You had to, be wanting to go there it's a long drive it's a windy drive it's a right. like if you're going there it's because you want to go there so it's like what it just i don't i don't understand how people have that kind of i don't either i don't either so of course this murder made its way into the news and gained insane popularity as i'm sure you can well imagine but due to the times and this is stupid most of the headlines about the case and the articles themselves focused on the fact that the two murdered individuals were devil worshippers and that their oh. homosexuality was talked about as well and the unusual sexual devices that had been found around the manor. This happened in Georgia and there, news of the murders, the additional details, and even the crime scene photos spread all over the country, even making its Jesus. way to places like Sacramento. Ugh. All right. Let's go back to our murderers. Kenneth Avery okay. Brock and Samuel Tony West. By the time that the bodies of Charles and Joseph were found, Brock and West were long gone. They had decided on the night of the murder that they needed to flee to Mexico. Classic. I mean, so honestly, <laughs> this is the first time that I think you've told me about a crime where someone was like, we should probably go now. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> the one smart thing. Right. So they load up into Charles's Jeep and immediately left town. They drove through the night and <laughs> yes, eventually- take the stolen car. That makes sense. The very obvious stolen car. Right. So they made it to- The one with the purposes. pentagrams, right? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. So they made it to Vicksburg, Mississippi, which we covered in Mississippi. I covered. They got there on December 15th. They stopped at a rest stop in Bovina, which is like right near Vicksburg, to get some rest before continuing on with their escape. But now they're in Mississippi. They sort of realize that the car they're in, Charles's black Jeep with the bent, with the white pentagrams oh, painted on it, shit. might be a bit too much and a bit too easy to identify. Oh. So they just <laughs> oh shit <laughs> so they decided that they needed a more discreet car one that wouldn't stand out as much and somehow these boys got lucky not far from them they see a pretty plain nondescript toyota but there was one problem with this toyota 26 year old navy lieutenant kirby key phelps was sleeping behind the wheel oh no The two decided they needed this car more, so they forced Phelps, recent Georgia Tech grad, out of the car and led him into a grove of trees behind the rest stop. Brock went back to the cars while Wes stayed in the trees with Phelps. Their plan had originally been to tie him to a tree with handcuffs that they had, then steal his car. So Brock is transferring all of their things from one car to the other while Wes is supposedly in the woods with Phelps, handcuffing him to the tree. Then out of nowhere, Brock hears multiple gunshots. Oh my god. Running back to the trees, he sees West pointing a gun at Phelps, having just fired at the lieutenant, killing him. Mm. As West was trying to handcuff Phelps to the tree, he had tried to escape, so West shot him three times, all to the head. Bullshit. Yep. They took the fully packed Toyota, got out of Mississippi, and continued on their way. Phelps's body was later found that same morning by two men searching for Civil War relics about 200 yards in the woods behind the rest stop. So the two ended up pawning the car's stereo equipment and other things of value at a shop in Austin, Texas. It's not. <laughs> what did you think? Immediately, I was like, oh, my God, they left the Jeep there. It has the pentagrams on it. They're going to think it's some sort of other, like, satanic thing. And these guys are going to lose their shit. <laughs> no, <laughs> they stole it, too. Yep. Also. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so in Texas is where the two had a falling out and decided to split ways. Wes and Brock? Uh-huh. Okay. West continued on while Brock started to head back to Georgia, hitchhiking his way home. Stupid. Charles's abandoned Jeep was soon found 12 miles south of Tallulah, Louisiana. Louisiana authorities ran the plates and found that it was registered to Chattooga County quite a ways away. Police in Louisiana gave the county a call and Sheriff McConnell, the one from before, was the one to take the call. This finally gave him his first lead to the murder case he was dealing with. 
and Sheriff McConnell got a second huge break in the case when Teresa Hudgens, one of the teens who had been forced to tag along the night of the murder, came forward and told him everything that had, had happened. At least someone has a sound mind in this story. Right. So he immediately issued arrest warrants for Avery Brock and Tony West. Through his hitchhiking journey, Brock eventually made it to Marietta, just south of the county. While there, he called his mom, who informed him about the arrest warrant and that it was out for him. Knowing he was done, Brock hung up the phone, walked into a nearby gas station, and confessed everything that he had done to the gas station attendant. <laughs> <laughs> that poor person! <laughs> <laughs> the image <laughs> i know i know so moments later police swarmed the gas station and brock was immediately taken into custody without incident when he was arrested he was wearing a suit and a pair of shoes these clothes were later id'd to have belonged to phelps <sighs> now on to west after the two split in texas i don't know where he was heading but he somehow ended up in missouri uh That's it was when the he direction was... of mexico no not really so i was like where are you going buddy <laughs> so it's when he's in Missouri that he decides that he should probably turn around and head back to the East Coast. He was out of money and had nowhere else to go. On Christmas Eve, he was on his way through Chattanooga, Tennessee, when he ran out of gas. He had no money. He was tired, exhausted. So he walked in the rain to a highway lounge. Luck would have it that he found a police officer to whom he also confessed. He, too, was immediately taken into custody, also without incident. Okay. So this part is annoying, but also on brand. The day mm. after Christmas, the Atlanta Constitution, the news thing, reported on the arrest of the second murder suspect. But rather than really talking about and villainizing the villains, the murderers, the article went on to villainize the victims. Of course they did. The murder victims saying, quote, Scudder and Odom were described by authorities as homosexual devil worshippers who lived in a dank castle-like home cluttered with skulls, pornographic materials, an extensive occult library and statues of Satan, serpents, lizards and frogs. So, yes, let's focus on the victim's lifestyle that had no has nothing no to do and yeah. not the murders has nothing to do it like their lifestyle choices were not the reason that they got killed. No, not at all. Not it's at all. Two dumbass men thought they had money and they didn't. Right. It's and greed. the fact that they were gay. So obviously, mm, like that we can too. Hurt them, people are going to be happy about it. Right. So obviously there was a trial and was well underway by February 1983. During this trial, Brock did admit to killing Joseph Odom and was given three consecutive life terms. He is now and still serving time at the Coffee Correctional Facility in Southern Georgia. Today, he would be about 58 years old. Oh, my God. So I forgot how young he was. Yep. Then Wes came up to the stand. And let me just say, his reasonings for the crimes are so stupid and anger inducing. So he was being charged with murdering Charles Scudder, but he pled innocent. He went on to claim that the murders were an act of, quote, revenge for the embarrassment suffered by Brock when he had allowed Dr. Scudder to perform oral sex on him during an earlier visit. So he's killing Scudder because Scudder had performed oral sex on Brock. Even though consensually. Brock. Yeah. But it was gay, so that's not okay. He also went on to say that the crimes were due to the LSD that Charles had spiked his wine with. He was out of his mind in a drug-fueled haze, and that's why he committed the crimes. He didn't know what he was doing. He wasn't responsible for his actions. But forensic analysis was done on the wine bottles and revealed there were no traces of LSD. Good. When this defense failed, his defense tried to say that Charles had bewitched West because he was into the occult, obviously. Oh. And Wes claimed, yeah, this was true, because he had seen Charles' golden harp pulsing with an evil glow. <laughs> and throughout his trial, and this should come as absolutely no shock, West's attorneys made many homophobic insinuations about Joseph and Charles, trying to really highlight that part of the victims, trying to make them seem evil, and that what West did really wasn't bad. It wasn't as bad as being gay. But his trials weren't over. Overall, West ended up having two trials, obviously the first one for the death of Charles and the second one for the death of Navy Lieutenant Kirby Phelps. Okay. After he had been found guilty for the murder of Charles in Georgia, he had been handed over to authorities in Mississippi to then be tried for the murder of Phelps on September 26th. Several days of testimony went by, and in the end, the jury found Tony West guilty on all counts. All right. He was sentenced to death by electric chair. Hell Yeah. But the following year in 1980, he appealed. 
I tried reading the court document to like give information about it, but one, this case was long, and two, it didn't make sense. It was all over the place. I understood nothing. They just tried to appeal for many different reasons. They wanted a new trial, blah, blah, blah. It didn't work. I think when you get the death penalty, you get an automatic repeal or appeal. appeal. I think so. But he ended up pleading guilty in exchange for his death sentence to be changed to life in prison instead. Mm. So he's currently serving a sentence at Augusta State Medical Prison, and he is about 71 years old right now. Uh, I could get on board with a death by electrocution because that shit would hurt. I think it would, too. That's why and it's so no longer so, used. Right. And some, you know, some people just, they deserve to get hurt. Yes, absolutely. So, so during his confession, West said, quote, all I can say is they were devils and I killed them. That's how I feel about it. He thought people would be happy that he killed the devils and the gay people that were in the community. Oh, and I'm sure there were. Oh, there I'm absolutely sure there were. were. Definitely people that were happy. Whoa. No, there absolutely were. So we still don't have a full motive for why Brock and Brock and West committed the murders. Chattooga County Sheriff or Jerry McConnell told the Atlanta Constitution that the robbery was probably 50% motive and 50% devil worshipping and homosexuality. So they should have been killed because they were gay and devil worshipping, which they weren't. But So even in death, they're being blamed for what happened to them. That's Like, it's just awful. It's pathetic. It is pathetic. It is heartbreaking and just... I know people can do I know. so much better and it, it, it takes it costs nothing. I said this to my kids. There is not a time in your life that you will feel bad for doing something kind. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. It's never going to make you feel bad to be a kind person. Right. So just a few months after the murders in January of 1983, arsonists came to Corpsewood Manor and burned down both the manor no. and the chicken house, including the pink room. Mm hmm. So today, all that remains of Corpsewood Manor are a pile of bricks in a densely forested mountain ridge known as Taylor's Ridge covered in overgrowth. The pink gargoyle that stood over the front door has been stolen since, and many bricks from the structure have been taken as well. But it isn't a place of tranquility. No, no. Many believe that the property is haunted and shrouded in evil. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Locals refer to the mountains in the, that the house is nestled in as Devil Worshippers Mountain, or DW for short. Locals have claimed to see men patrolling the area carrying machetes and machine guns. People who have visited the ruins claim to feel evil in the place. Even while police were investigating, like the police, they investigated a feeling of being watched and the feeling that there was a strange presence at Corpsewood. Yeah, because that motherfucker came back and said, fuck y'all, you burned down my house. I'm not going to let you be around my space peacefully now that you did me dirty. Yeah. I would the fuck out of that place. And they do, because those who have visited have also reported hearing gunshots, dogs barking, glass shattering, and a harp playing. Oh, no, People no. have reported seeing apparitions or the glowing red eyes of Beelzebub, the couple's dog, staring out at them from the woods. One person who visited, 404 Photo, posted on Reddit that they went with a small group and everyone in the group heard a voice from one side of the woods. Oh. Then REXIGN is 666 said that they also went with a group. So there are four of them total, and they said that noises there just travel differently. So they said they were all relatively close to each other, but no matter how loud they spoke, no one could hear each other, no matter how close they were standing. They also said that a little ways down Dead Horse Road towards the water, the sounds of bird and the sounds of nature just go away completely. Ooh. The poster said- in my book. Oh, it's so creepy. Mm -hmm. So this poster said, quote, it was eerily silent and simultaneously difficult to hear. Mm. and another person visited and wrote about their experience in an article on wordpress.com the author said that they came here with their family when they were about 12 years old they were in the open area that was positioned between the shower and the outhouse the author said that in this area they heard the distinct howling and growls of two dogs mm -hmm. there is also a rumor that this place is cursed and that the bricks that once made up the manor are cursed as well amy patrola right. authored a book called the corpsewood manor murders in north georgia it goes into the whole story of what happened at the manor, the murders, and the hauntings that have stuck around. In her book, she said, quote, the looters began reporting accidents, injuries, and tragedies occurring close in time to their taking of a brick. And yet again, the bits of masonry were restored with mumbled apologies just in case before the takers rapidly fled. 
That's it said that if you to call karma. Oh, yeah. So it said if you take a brick, you will be cursed for life. There's a tale of someone who once stole one of the bricks. They started experiencing a whole slew of bad luck. The person mm-hmm. believes they fell under a curse because they took the brick. Mm-hmm. Tula noted in her book that those who have stolen other items from the castle seem to have strange things happen once the items enter their home. Maybe the area is being haunted by Joseph, whose ashes were scattered in the rose garden that he cared so much about. Aww. And apparently a dark stain appeared on one of the boarded windows near the library after the murders. Many believe mm-hmm. that this is Charles still watching over the land. Mm-hmm. So a group called the Paranormal Files came to Corpsewood and filmed their experience. They have a video on YouTube called Corpsewood Manor, the scariest house in America. So I will admit that they didn't really get much and they were kind of eh, but it was a creepy location. It was cool to like look at the ruins. But one of the investigators said that they caught a weird whisper, which I did hear. It did not sound like wind. It sounded like a weird whisper. They also had a weird feeling of danger while they were there. Mm -hmm. They did some dousing rod stuff, but I don't believe in dousing rods. It's the things where you hold them and the things cross or whatnot because I've used them before. If you move your hand slightly where no one else can see it, but you're moving your hand, you can move those things. Yeah. They used an obelisk, so the spirit box, which spits out words. Mm -hmm. The box said shot and ghost. Ooh. At one point, it also said sex and Betty. Ooh. And then they also have that stick figure program. So it's a program where... If someone's walking, you can see like a stick figure version of the person. Oh, so the program was picking up something near the ruins, which was actually pretty creepy. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much all they found today. Apparently, people still visit here to commit crimes of insurance fraud. Not really sure how. And people have even disposed of some bodies. But there you go. Corpsewood Manor and the awful, horrible murder that was committed there. Sorry, this was so long, but there was just too much to add. This was a wild ride. Don't you just love Charles and Joseph? I do. I do. It just is so sad. And just how they were like villainized after their death. Like it's 100% victim blaming. They did nothing wrong other than being gay and being part of the Church of Satan. That's all they did wrong. Well, they chose not wrong, but. Right. They chose a different lifestyle against the norm and. Anyone who does that, even now, when people do that, people go up in arms. And I get it. It's different. It, it's shocking to see something that's so different than what you're used to. I can give mm-hmm. you that. But that doesn't make it not okay. That doesn't make it unacceptable. I know. It, it's, it's just different. Ugh. And that's something you can get used to. I know. And you don't even have to do it. No one said you had to do that. That's what I, don't I know. Understand. It's, like, it's so sad. They deserved better. They deserved so much better. And but I do yeah. hope they haunt the fuck out of that place and curse. I hope so. Because you know what? Fuck being nice. And I hope they're living their best life still together. I hope so too. I'm sure they like are. Like something in the afterlife. I hope they're enjoying their happy, beautiful mansion. Those seem like souls that would transcend cosmos together. Oh, they do. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. It, good story though very good story thank you. I, I liked thank you. I do I felt like I liked how you really were able to get a lot of background on the victims and who they were and you know I felt like I almost felt like which, this connection to them which I really wanted to do I wanted to get yeah. a lot of background on them because they were great and their story does deserve to be told and absolutely ugh. it's ugh. a beautiful story it was thank you yes I liked it. All right. So Mackenzie, what do you have for me tonight? (sighs) Okay. Get comfy because this is a doozy. Oh, oh man. Another doozy. So a few episodes ago, I was thinking about how we haven't covered (laughs) too many stories on on cults recently. (gasps) And maybe I can find some somewhere that isn't, you know, well known. Oh, I'm so excited. (laughs) And I thought it'd be hard because, you know, certainly... (laughs) Can't be cults still operating? False. Yes, they can. <gasps> For whatever reason, Georgia seems to have a lot. Maybe because I was focused on this state, but it seemed to have an unusually high number. I found three <laughs> separate cults that in the last two years have been raided by the FBI or police <gasps> for one reason or another. Oh my gosh. Most of them are currently, as in 2023, 
under investigation and have not gone to trial yet. That is wild to me. When you think about cults, or at least when I think about cults, I think of like the 70s, the 80s, not the 2020s. Mm -mm. One of these cults is the Hope of Prayer Christian Church, or HOPK. 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 So I go back and forth between saying House of Prayer or HOPK. 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> If only. <laughs> All right. So, Hakp, Hak, whatever, uh, which had multiple of their churches raided by the FBI. In fact, it was that raid that brought the DOJ's attention to Hak and will hopefully be their demise. Definitely some trigger warnings. This case discusses suicide, sexual assault, and rape, psychological, psychological manipulations, among a plethora of other mental health things that cult members that a cult will do to its members. So. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. Right. So before we go into this story, I want to provide some background on the psycholo and the psychology of cults. I'm only going to go over the basics. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, you know, can be filled in, but I'm going to save most of the juicy information for a special episode later. Oh on. my God. I'm so excited. Yes. Oh, so yes, we do this, have fun episodes coming up in October. Yeah. This excerpt <laughs> from Discovery Magazine provides a brief overview of why someone might join a cult in the psychological, in the psychology, I keep wanting to say psychological, in the psychology of a cult leader. Experts who have studied cults suggest the human need for comfort prompts people to seek out others or things to soothe their fears and anxieties research suggests that those elements and others have led hundreds of thousands of people to commit to thousands of cults operating around the world they provide meaning purpose and belonging says josh hart a professor of psychology at union college who studies personality and so in social psychology worldviews and belief systems they offer a clear confident vision and assert their superiority over the group as to the leaders themselves, they typically prevent themselves as infallible, confident, and grandiose. Their charisma draws people in, Hart says, and followers who are craving peace, belonging, and security might gain a sense of those things, as well as confidence through participation in the group. So, I'm sure many of you will ask the age-old question, why didn't they just leave? Hopefully, this small insight into the psychology of it will help provide clarity and open your mind to some compassion for the victims and survivors. And also, sometimes it's dangerous. Exactly. On like June the Branch Davidians in Texas, like Waco, mm -hmm. they couldn't leave. Mm -mm. Neither mm -hmm. really could these guys. So on June 23rd, 2022, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a year ago, a year ago, mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. the FBI served search warrants on six House of Prayer Christian churches in in North Carolina, Georgia, Washington, Texas, and California. The FBI at the time confirmed the searches, but would not address what they were related to or any connection to a particular case. All that is known about Hopk at the time is that they have 11 churches across the country that all sit outside of military bases. It is possible that they have been, they have been swindling veterans out of their education and disability benefits. <gasps> Authority, authorities seized computers, church records, and cash, but have made no arrests. So what is the House of Prayer Christian Church or Hopk? And why are they being raided by the FBI? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. The age-old question. I'll tell you. <laughs> so most of the information about the history of the cult comes directly from former members who have left the church and have since sought justice for all the crimes committed by the House of Prayer. You can read more information and help support their cause by going to H-O-P-C-C, all lowercase, dot com, which is a blog that former members have created to expose the church. An expert on cults described House of... Pr I'm just going to say House of Prayer. I feel like Hopk sounds weird. Does it sound okay. weird? You don't care? Okay. No. Okay. You gave us a nice little preference to let us be aware of it. So, okay. So, an expert on cults described Hopk as a destructive authoritarian church, but that Ronnie Dennis could be seen as a charismatic authoritarian cult leader because of the methods he used to recruit people. According to one former member, Ronnie Dennis, founder and leader of the House of Prayer of Christian Church cult, told his members in a Sunday service, quote, God gave me permission to kill everybody in here, but I won't because I love you. Oh, oh yeah, that's not problematic at all. Hmm. 
So Dennis was an army veteran whose uh, service included an admin position in South Korea in the mid 1980s. I had a really hard time finding information specifically on him, like his life, because most right. of what I found was testimonies from former members. So mm. there are aspects of his life that I'm not sure about. I can, there's some gaps I'll be able to fill in, but his personal life and that kind of thing, there's not at least that I could find there right. wasn't much. Um, but I do know that he was married and did have a daughter. Okay. So after his time in the army, Dennis joined, joined NTCC new Testament Christian center or Christian huh? church. Also a cult. I, I kind of, yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. It sounds you'll like see it in a minute. Be. Oh, you'll see in a minute. <laughs> and he started planning ideas of leaving to start his own church. In the beginning of 2003, Dennis would speak with other members about his mission and goal for his church. He told Frederick Irwin that his church would, quote, sacrifice, pray, be humble, sincerely love the people, and of course, preach the gospel to reach the world. Irwin believed that NTCC lost sight of those things. Dennis had told others that they needed nicer things. Erwin thought that this was strange, that they were planning to start an organization from the ground up, and new sacrifices would need to be made to accomplish that. Dennis was using this illusion of nicer things to give comfort to those he was trying to convince to flee the NTCC ministers. See? Definitely a cult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like forgetting to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, realized Irwin towards the end of my story, I started to talk faster. I was like, damn it. Because <laughs> I talk fast and I get excited. Yeah, I forget to and like it, it was really intense. So I was like talking really fast. <clears throat> Erwin believes that this was when things started to go south for Dennis and his madness really took root. In 2004, House of Prayer split from NTCC and established themselves in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but shortly after moved to Hinesville, Georgia. Erwin lived with Ronnie and his wife, Marjorie, for over two years before he was pushed out. His job was to get the Bible college started, teach, keep track of financial records and many other office jobs. Erwin became a trusted confidant and friend to Dennis, and having lived with him, he was witness to the events that led Dennis on the path of the devil. Oh, God. This is, this is what Erwin, Erwin described in his testimony on the HOPCC.com blog website. He refinanced his house on 428 Willow Oak in either late 2004 or early 2005. After some eyewash upgrades and an inflated appraisal from the appraiser, they were able to manipulate. He added to his house by expanding his bedroom and giving Marjorie a bigger and far grander master bathroom with a large hot tub. Probably not the best optics, I thought, given our first year, but he came in with his own money, having earned it long prior to the split. So who was I to judge? Not a big deal, is what I convinced myself afterwards. And who's this talking? The former member, Frederick Irwin. Okay. He lived with Dennis. Well, okay, Ronnie okay. Dennis. You know, never trust anyone with two first names. Nope. So I mostly call him Dennis in the story because that's his last name. Right. Okay. The idea of creating quick cash, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> <laughs> through a refinance and taking out a second mortgage gave him the idea to convince church members to buy houses in their name in order to pull off the same scam. They would use the same manipulation process Dennis used on his own home to inflate appraisals, refinance the loans, take out home equity lines of credit, and get lots of quick cash for the church. Oh, of course, for the church. Mm -hmm. Dennis even created the People Helping People group to run his operation. And this was just the beginning for Dennis's real estate scheme. In early 2005, Irwin started to realize that things were getting weird. And Dennis's is <laughs> creatures <laughs> <laughs> weren't matching his actions. He had been doing work at the office that afternoon and was running late for church. He stopped at home, the one he shared with Dennis, the Dennis's. To mm -hmm. change before church, and just as he was leaving, a car pulled up with Dennis, his wife, and some other members. Irwin knew that he was running 15 minutes late, so the service would have already started. Why would Dennis and all the other people be driving up to the house? Well, mm -hmm. he had just come back from Sands Club, and he had a new vanity for the bathroom. And he was going to have the members install it instead of going to church. Why would this be such an issue for Irwin? Well, here's what he had to say. Quote, it was beyond hypocritical. We would get blasted for missing church to improve our home if we dare do that. Yeah, he found it okay to keep a bunch of people out of church for his own self-serving reasons. He acted super odd when our eyes met, convicted and guilty. It was like that look a kid gives his mom when his hand is in the cookie jar and she walks up on him. The tension was super thick. While this may be small, 
and on the surface or seemingly insignificant, make no mistake, it was my first realization of a major difference in his attitude and focus. From this point on, Irwin started to lose faith in Dennis. He would start to see him as a self-serving manipulator and phony that he was. Irwin writes, quote, I questioned his motives and everything and began seeing how he manipulates people emotionally for the desired outcome, which strengthened my mind against such tactics. I thought back on the many times he manipulated me emotionally and used cult like guilt. Yeah. By 2005, 2006, Dennis <clears throat> didn't really hide his greed that well. He had bought two new cars, a 2005 Chrysler 300C and a new Infiniti QX56. No idea, but sounds fancy. They do sound fancy. And they also sound like they're from the year that it is. Yes. So they're expensive. <laughs> um, That's why people buy used. Right. <laughs> <laughs> also at this point, Dennis had several properties that were bringing in money. One of the guys helping Dennis would brag about the work that he was doing. He would tell people how he would be, he was racking up 20,000 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I put the wrong symbol. <laughs> I put the dollar repeat, sign in. It would, repeat yeah. what the symbol mm -hmm. was because I laughed. <laughs> it was the money symbol. It wasn't supposed to be $20,000. It was supposed to be 20,000 minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. He would tell people how he was racking out 20,000 minutes for only 50 bucks a month. That was about 13 hours on the phone running these mortgage scams and directing the building crews. In order to keep business flowing, there was a lot of lying, signature practicing, and document fraud. During this time, Irwin was trying to keep his distance from Dennis, and Dennis could tell. He made Irwin move out of the house and into one of the church's houses. This house was not the one of the houses that was in Irwin's name. But Dennis still required Irwin to fill it with furniture so it would be used as a, quote, showroom as an example of the nice things. Dennis leveraged the fact that he provided Irwin with a house to guilt him into going into debt to furnish it. Oh, my gosh. Irwin had finally had enough. He could no longer follow blindly behind this man he once considered his leader and connection to God. Irwin writes, quote, you're right. When I get excited, I start to try to read faster and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A voice often doubted and feared prevailed to lead me out of Hopk and make one of the best decisions of my life. It wasn't easy by any means, and I was alone for a long time in complex fear. There is no excuse for what I've done, and it's right that I share the truth. Irwin left the church in 2006, but his troubles weren't over. The church tracked him down to the hotel he was staying at to pressure him to come back. That Irwin is told so him no. scary. Oh, absolutely. Erin told them no, but that didn't stop him from seeing members of the church stalking him. They sent private investigators, cops to his house, used credit cards to track his whereabouts. They tried hacking his passwords and even tried calling UPS, pretending to be him to verify his address. It sounds a lot like Scientology because Scientology does a lot of this stuff when a member is able to leave if they are. They'll like stalk them and track them and try to get them to sign things over to them in like a really manipulative way. Like it's so creepy. Well, and like, they already have things signed over in their name. Right. Like, they already have it. So right. they're leaving with that still intact. But Irwin started going by a different name and did try to keep a low profile. Irwin had to leave his wife behind. They had agreed that when they were in NTCC that if one of them had decided to leave, they wouldn't make the other go with them. Irwin knew his wife would never come with him. To her, leaving Dennis would be like leaving God. And in 2010, Irwin told Dennis he wanted his name off the properties and told him he had a year to do it. Whenever Irwin would call, they continued to tell him lies. And at some point, he received fake divorce papers from his wife. Dennis faked most of the documents he used. In 2012, Ir Irwin filed for bankruptcy because of the damage the cult had done. They tried to get his ex-wife to file a motion to have the properties transferred to her, but a judge said, no. <laughs> Their divorce wasn't legit. It was like the right. equivalent of Dennis being like, you're married. Now you're not. Mm -hmm. It's not real. Right. Um, you have no authority yeah. to do that. Exactly. Frederick Irwin is still suffering the repercussions of Dennis's actions today. However, he has found his way back to the church and worked with other members to expose the House of Church for fraudsters. So testimony from a former member, Adam Bowles, who was a minister and building coordinator of, a of HOP, sheds more light on Ronnie Dennis during the early days. Bowles joined NTCC after the Army in 1993. In 1995, he met his wife, Julie, in NTCC and first met Dennis in January of 1996. Uh, Dennis was going to be his overseer as Bowles trained to be a minister. He writes his story on thehop.com blog, describing Dennis as being, quote, always paranoid about what others thought about him. So he planted all these seeds of doubt in my mind about others to try to make himself appear greater than he. In the world, we would call this little man syndrome. Mm hmm. Yes, we would. 
At one they point, while serving, too. <laughs> 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 oh man I mean I was thinking about one of my exes tomato tomato <laughs> oh man at one point while serving NTCC in 2003 Bowles was working for the ministry in Oceanside California and it was struggling since Dennis was an overseer, he came in and helped get up the numbers and the money flowing. Cult? Definitely cult. Cult, 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 cult. Oh, yeah. All the signs. Yeah. Dennis had also convinced Bulls that it was Julie's fault for the failures. At one of point, course. it made mm-hmm. At one point, it made Bulls doubt if he should still be with Julie. Oh, my god. They worked through it. But two years later, Dennis became their neighbor. And in 2002, Dennis started to plant the seeds of doubt about NTCC leadership. Julie told Bowles that if there was a split, that she would want to go with Dennis. And they did just that. The House of Church split from NTCC in 2003. Dennis became very demanding about the amount of work that Bowles did over the years. He would spend countless hours searching for ways to get materials for cheap, save the church money. Dennis would scream at Bowles when he wasn't happy, and he would call Julie under the guise of helping him, but it just caused them to fight. In July of 2010, Julie had gone to headquarters in Hinesville for a few days. Dennis sent one of his henchmen, Derby, to give Bowles additional work. Bowles made the mistake of expressing to Derby how overwhelmed he had been feeling with the amount of work he had to do. Derby told Dennis, and Dennis called Bowles to yell and scream at him to leave. Bowles drove home, but by then, Dennis had filled Julie with all sorts of lies about Bowles. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's bad. So, trigger warning. It's bad. He wrote, quote, Dennis had already filled her head with a bunch of trash, told her I was a homosexual and she didn't even want to be around me. I was not a homosexual. I am not a child molester, nor did I ever have sex with animals. But over the next several years, Dennis filled my heart and mind with so many sexual perversions. And I was under such fear and confusion that I would do anything to get God back and have my life restored. He goes on to say, quote, the accusations were overwhelming. I barely slept and didn't eat for nine days. I was contemplating suicide as Dennis told me to not talk to Julie anymore and had her tell me that she could never be with someone like me. His fear and intimidation over the next decade have been nothing short of torture. He would call me with the hope of restoration one minute and the next time he'd be threatening excommunication and him praying against me the next if I quit. His fear and intimidation worked with me. I was a soldier used to taking orders, and I feared losing Julie if I didn't confess to all my acts of homosexuality, bestiality, and child molestation. I told him I wasn't any of that, but he kept telling me I was lying, and that I needed to keep writing my sins down and confessing them. I couldn't believe the very things that would come to my mind, horrific things that I confessed to Dennis that I did, every time expressing to him how I couldn't believe how I had buried those awful things in my heart. This went on for nearly 10 years. Oh my god. Dennis isolated Bowles from the rest of the church for years. When he went to church on Sundays, the other members would avoid him. If a visitor came to the church because outsiders were allowed to Sunday services. Oh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. That's also how they got people. Oh, yes. Good point. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if a visitor to the church uh, sat near him, then another member would ask them to move. Bowles wrote, quote, I could handle the humiliation, the shame, the pain, for he convinced me I had hurt so many others that I deserved to be cut off from everyone. As he said, I should be in solitary confinement for the rest of my life. He told me I was worse than Hitler. He also Ugh. said I was worse than a serial killer who raped, tortured, and murdered dozens or even hundreds of people. Oh, my God. By February of 2020, Bowles was finally able to find the courage and strength to leave the church. By this time, Dennis had taken $40,000 from Bowles' account. Julie had divorced him and moved in with Dennis, took out credit cards in his name, ruined his credit to where he now owes $50,000 in debt. Holy shit. Yeah. And we we're just at the beginning, my dude. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah. So Arlene Braden joined House of Prayer in January of 2004. He was a minister at the church headquarters in Hinesville, and he shared a story with hop.com. Quote, I must share my insight into this destructive cult, which is hidden beneath a Bible, a strict outward holiness standard, and an extremely controlling charismatic figure named Ronnie Dennis, who has deceived his followers into believing he is God's last prophet to the world and that the only way to be saved is to come to God through him. Mm -hmm, Of course. So he tells about the polycom, which is a phone line that they can connect many lines to, and it can be patched through the church's PA system. So it doesn't matter where Dennis is, he can talk to the people in church. 
Oh. Like wow. God. Yep. So Dennis would call people over to the polycom to praise him. He asked one member, quote, if God came down and said that Reverend Dennis was not of God, what would you say? She said that she would tell God that she respectfully disagrees. He asked another pastor to share with the group a conversation that they had had the night before. The pastor said, quote, I know we are all messed up. And unless you, referring to Ronnie Dennis, call our name, we are all going to hell. Okay, first off, if you're saying you're someone of God. And then God comes down and says, you're not part of me. Why would you argue? Because you don't think that's God. You think the other guy's God. So this is how Brayden described how Ronnie Dennis would manipulate and deceive others. He actually gave like a really nice list of like kind of breaking it down of like, this is what he does. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to share his list. Okay. So this message of hope and change draws the crowd with Hop twisting Bible scriptures to get people off balance and then manipulating them, bringing them under complete control. Ronnie Dennis knows how to break someone down to where they are dependent on him. He has money and power and he knows how to use both. Let me give you some insight as to how the satanic cult master works. He's calling him Satan. Not that it's a satanic cult. (laughs) (laughs) One, he creates in them a need, a deep need for God, but really for him, because he is the only one that is right in the world. He claims God spoke to him saying, you are the last remainder who I have called to do this. I need you. This is how he breaks people down. He needs a person's trust. Then he suggests something that might have happened. Then he will come back later, maybe the next day with, do you remember this happening? Memory implantation is a technique used in cognitive psychology to investigate human memory. In memory implantation studies, researchers make people believe that they remember an event that actually never happened. And he even put a link to Wikipedia of where he got that information. (laughs) There's one experiment that we learned about in psychology. They would show a ton of people a picture of them in a hot air balloon. And they're like, do you remember this trip you took in a hot air balloon when you were younger? And all the participants were like, oh my God, yeah, it was so much fun. Like it was the coolest experience I've ever had. All of the pictures were photoshopped. Not a single one of those people had ever been in a hot air balloon. But if you can convince someone enough, like, yeah, it's the whole memory implantation. People are going to be like, oh yeah, I remember that. That's why eyewitness accounts are never reliable. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So number two, Ronnie twists the scriptures to get people to separate from their families. He tears down parents, uncles, aunts, and everyone. He wants his followers to have no outside influence. He even gets them to throw away their family pictures. Oh my gosh. Number three, cult master Ronnie condemns all your past and makes you feel worthless and no good to the point of depression. To where your glory is and think it spiritual to call yourself a piece of trash, dirt, or even dung. Some classes from the day school went on a field trip to the sewage treatment plant and the teacher told them that this is what they were, dung. Some of the children began talking like that, claiming that they saw themselves in the poop plant. Oh my gosh, that is so damaging. Oh, for sure. Number four. Rule number two. I knew it. Do not bring people back from the dead. (laughs) (laughs) Rule number four. He contemns all books, history, and commentaries, saying we have no proof that these people were saved. At the beginning of Hop, we put in the Prayer Forest Magazine articles about John Wesley, John Newton, Martin Luther, and many others, noting their contribution to the causes of Christ. Now all these men are called gay and ungodly. Number five. No internet, no TV, no Facebook, no newspaper, etc. This is Obviously, done in the name that's of- common. Mm -hmm. this is done in the name of holiness and i agree there's a lot of evil in social media if that is what you're looking for but really it is all about control ronnie wants his cult followers to only hear from him he says that god is not going to speak to you but god will speak to him the pastor about you and he ronnie will tell you what god said but jesus said and then he quotes some shit that i'm not gonna repeat because fuck (laughs) (laughs) these people are so religious and i'm like whatever makes you happy right although it is interesting because Ronnie's saying this one scripture and then a lot of the testimonies include scripture like using it as almost evidence to say this is why what he was doing was wrong if you just look at this verse in the bible and I'm like that's problem numero uno my friends that's what people are doing now right it's like like this one he says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and those people know the voice of God but cult leaders teach otherwise which makes sense Mm-hmm. But, yeah. mm. And also, we had a friend of ours who was part of a very religious group that could low-key be a cult, um, but 
they wouldn't allow her to read any material that they didn't provide. So if she were trying to do her own research into something or was trying to read anything else, they would be like, no, no, you can only read our material. Is there a state or a couple states doing that? Hmm. Huh. Huh. Oh my gosh, did you hear about this one state though? There was some library and they banned a ton of books. And so some lady was like, well, if you're going to ban all those books, you need to ban the Bible too. You want to, like, this is what the Bible talks about. And so they had to ban the Bible because of the arguments that she made. She was like, if you're banning those other books, you have to ban the Bible. Hell yeah. Yep. (sighs) Mm -hmm. Although for these guys, I do give them compassion. But my point, separate from that is... While you also can pull scripture that says that this person is wrong, he clearly can pull scripture that says he's right. And so yep. there's too many conflicting. Uh, That's what the whole Bible is. That's why there's so many different branches of Christianity and religions, because they pick one verse or one line in the mm-hmm. Bible and that's what they go with and it goes against other lines and verses in the Bible. Like it's just yep. it's such a contradicting thing that ugh. and Jesus didn't even like the guy who wrote the Bible, Paul. Like the guy who said that all this shit happened, he never met Jesus. Well, all of them wrote parts of it. But yeah, it was like a big game of telephone. Yeah, but like on this podcast I listened to, they had this expert of like religion, but like the history of religion. Oh, that's cool. And Paul, who, you know, people say that like this person did exist, but what their whatever was. Yeah. Apparently, it was like 40 years later. And apparently Paul never met Jesus, never talked to him. I've heard that before. And I'm like, so it literally was all fucking made up. Mm Mm-hmm. Or a big game of telephone. So number six, Ronnie knows how to implant memory into people. I will not even try to explain all of this. Look it up. I will tell you it is real. The cult master Ronnie first worked on my daughter, then on my wife, and used both against me, accusing me of all types of wicked, perverted things. But the crazy part is that my wife and daughter were part of the perverted acts, and they say they liked it. He goes on to say, they also say many other couples were involved with us throughout the years. I have contacted many of these people, and they are writing sworn statements denying these insane allegations. I have personally gone and told one preacher whom my wife and daughter claim raped our daughter when she was 11, while the preacher's wife, my wife, and I were all naked doing things to each other in the same room, basically watching an 11-year-old girl get raped. Right. That's what this guy was saying was going on. Exactly. For months, cult master Ronnie Dennis would call my wife and daughter on the phone, planting memories in in me of this and many other such things until I began to falsely believe and confess that some of it happened. I was losing my mind. This was torture. But after I said some of it was true, I instantly knew it was not. Unfortunately, cult master Ronnie recorded all of the false confessions and played them for the entire church. So even little children heard graphic perverted things at Hop. Who? Oh. That's when Brayden knew that he needed to get out. Brayden decided to leave on May 18th, 2018. His wife of 30 years kicked him out of the house and no, he can no longer see his son, his daughter, or her husband. I'm not sure if they're back together now, though, because there's also a post on the blog that says, like, the, the headline is, like, Brayden's are alive and well. Mm-hmm. And when I read it, it talked about church members following them, maybe threatening their lives. It was kind of hard to tell. It seemed like there's missing information that it sounds like it maybe it was somewhere else. Right. But I couldn't find it. (laughs) Okay. So feel free to go check it out and let me know. (laughs) So we're up to 2017, give or take. At this point, Dennis has acquired three multi-million dollar homes, two in Georgia, one in Florida, and he has created a cult community that would shun members who left, even if they were family. By 2017, the blog had been formed by former members, and they were protesting outside House of Prayer churches. The Coastal Courier reported members, both current and former, were making claims on both sides. Hey, good people on both sides. Yup. The church denied what the the church denied Uh what the protesters were saying, but that didn't stop people from speaking out against them. One former member, Denise Stanley, told the Courier about her experiences when she was in the church. Her parents had joined when she was 12, and she shared how Dennis knew that she had been raped when she was a teenager. He brought her into a meeting with several other ministers and wanted her to give graphic details of her rape. Denise later married another member, and Dennis tried to get them involved in his real estate scam, but Denise wasn't having it. She could see right through the BS, so they thought they could try to intimidate her. She went up back down and didn't give in for that matter. 
Another former member shared the things she saw within the walls of the church, telling the courier, quote, I've seen teenagers who were stood up and told to confess they were whores just because she liked a young man in the church. They're teenagers. Teenagers like each other, but they were made to stand up on the stage and to say that they were whores. Wow. So military.com did a great job reporting this case from the military perspective. Interesting. Uh, So they had quotes from veterans who were also former members of the church. They provided more insight on how the House of Prayer kind of manipulated the military personnel and veterans to use their GI Bill and or disability benefits. Their report, along with other articles that I found from news outlets, is where I get most of the information. So a reporter from military.com visited the church's campus in Hinesville to ask about the federal investigation. The congregates declined to answer the questions or comments, but they did provide him with a tour of their facility. Reverend Jeff Derby, remember his henchman? Right. Told in a statement, quote, we have been advised by our lawyers not to speak, make comments, or make statements to the media or anyone while the Bible seminary is being investigated. He also warned the website not to approach members for interviews. They did, however, speak to former members who were victims of the church. The House of Prayer had been approaching troops and veterans for nearly 20 years. They would promise them a religious community that would understand them. Military.com reported that most of the former members are veterans or were active duty service members. Some of the members described having suicidal ideation or previous attempts. Most of the veterans were wounded in post-9-11 wars and had previous trauma, such as being a victim of sexual assault or came from disadvantaged backgrounds. An anonymous former member told Military.com that she joined the church in 2003 after she was sexually assaulted on base by a fellow serviceman. The recruiters could get into bases because they themselves were active military. Mm -hmm. Jane Doe told Military.com, quote, they helped me out. We're there for everything I needed, such as a ride to Walmart, and they were always there, so I didn't need my unit. The church wanted her to leave the barracks, but the army had rules that did not allow unmarried junior enlisted soldiers to live anywhere but the barracks. Jane Doe said they would warn women that the barracks are bad and that they would point them as unsafe for women so that they would spend more time in the church. After Jane Doe was assaulted, she managed to get permission to leave the barracks and move into the church. During one of the Sunday services, Dennis told the entire church that she had been assaulted because it was punishment for falling out of lockstep with the church. Jane Doe reported, quote, I was blamed publicly at the church, saying, how could I expect God's protection when I went outside his will to live? The pastor said in front of the entire church that had I been in church, this wouldn't have happened. Jesus. Since 2013, the church has collected more than $7 million in GI Bill payments for the Bible study classes. They were required that. Yeah. Which also huge fucking fuck up for the federal government. Like, (laughs) God damn. Uh Uh-huh. Whew. But we'll get into that later. (laughs) We're still, we're just now tipping. (laughs) Oh, my God. So they would require veteran students to recruit new members instead of going to class, and they were told to specifically target young soldiers and military spouses that were alone and had young children. The church would intentionally pick locations near military bases where it would draw from the steady stream of service members and their steady paychecks and educational benefits. Like, literally, I'm I'm almost positive. I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive. Every single, all 11 of their churches, all outside of military base. Yeah, which obviously it's showing you exactly what their motive is and like, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of what they're doing. Oh, for sure. So Rosalie Wright, who is an Army veteran and mother of four, told Military.com, quote, they said this is another way God is going to bless the church while blessing you as well. Describing what the church told her when they tried to get her to spend her GI Bill benefits. According to public records, the HOP charged the government millions in GI Bill benefits. Amber Fritz Randolph is a resident of Killen, Texas, which is the location of Fort Hood, the most populated Mm -hmm. U.S. military base in the world. One of Hop's churches was located right outside the base and was one of the ones searched by the FBI that I talked about in the beginning of the story. Right. Amber is the admin for Fort Hood's Fallen Facebook page, and she told Daily Beast that she had heard within the community that Hop is, quote, absolutely a cult. She said the ones in Kellen were sneaking into barracks at all hours to torment and threaten soldiers who wanted to stop going or wouldn't give them enough money. How did they get? All- oh, no, never mind. I was going to say, how did they get on base? But you mentioned they were. They were serving the military. Men. Right. Uh, Dennis himself is a veteran, an army veteran. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, A spokesperson for Fort Gordon, which is an army base outside of Augusta, Georgia, said, quote, Fort Gordon was aware of the organization called the Assembly of Prayer. Some it was both Mm -hmm. assembly of prayer house of prayer same thing okay 
um, called the Assembly of Prayer Church through our law enforcement channels, but the installation had no bans against the organization or any officials dealing with them, despite their website claims. Dennis had delivered a sermon that said all those who question him, the church, or its pursuits of VA benefits are a threat to the church. Of course they are. Put it on a website. Arlene Brandon, whose testimony from the hop.com blog provided a lot of the information and history of the cult, ran the Bible school from 2004 to 2018 when he left the church. Wow. He told military.com that when the church got approved for the GI bill around 2013, the cost of tuition went from $300 to $3,000. Brayden told reporters, quote, it burns me because there are a lot of good people who burn their VA money at these schools. They used all their college money to donate to Dennis's Rolls Royces. Jeez. Rosalie Wright left the church in 2016. Wright was the army veteran and the mother of four. She had Mm. served three years in the army in supply logistics. Wright wanted to become a nurse, but she would have to take out loans to pay for the expenses. And the years that she spent in this church had depleted her GI Bill benefits and left her with no marketable skills or degree. Uh. Wright had been pressured to attend the school and use her benefits. She told Military.com, quote, I'm still trying to get established and it doesn't feel great. When I got two kids in high school, I felt like I should be further along and I could really use the GI Bill right now. Mm -hmm. The VA allowed the House of Prayer to benefit from their program that helps buy houses for veterans with no money down and competitive interest rates. Ismail Samai, who served as an infantryman in the Army for 14 years, used up most of his GI Bill benefit and was also coerced into allowing the church to rent his home in Fayetteville when he was reassigned to Texas. He told Military.com, quote, you want to do the right thing. You don't want to be a sinner. Samai said the church would pressure its members to acquire as much real estate as possible. Pastors serve as the landlord and collect rent money directly from church members living there and either give it to Dennis or the church. Jeez. The church also owned several apartment complexes to generate rental income. One complex is in Hinesville, Georgia, home to the church's headquarters, and that was used to convince or tell service members, veterans, or any other member to live there. Or, I'm sorry, convince or tell service members, veterans, or any other member that had to live there. Members were told to live in the church dorms so they would be protected from the perils of the outside world. Oh, of course. Meanwhile, their houses would be rented to bring in revenue for the church, and the owners of those houses never saw a dime of that rent money. (sighs) My God. They would take out loans in the veteran parishioner's name and force their signature with the use of in-house notaries. The church had access to social security numbers and other personal information, which allowed them to continue to commit housing fraud. Now. Just disclaimer, this is all what I've read from news websites, so nothing has been formally charged. Right. This is all research, so we can't get in trouble for anything. Mm -hmm. This is what someone else said was probably happening. (laughs) And we are just reporting the facts that we read that anyone can read in any public place, and we will provide the links in our show notes. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so the church had access to social security numbers and other personal information, which allowed them to continue to commit housing fraud. They would use the veterans to cash in on cheaper interest rates and then charge rent that would be handed over to the church. Frederick Irwin, whose testimony we also heard from that provided mm-hmm. a lot of insight, told military.com, quote, I was disgusted at the priority he was placing on buying houses. He was manipulating people. It wasn't what I signed up for. The church saw injured veterans as prime targets and leaders coach veterans on how to lie to get 100% of their disability ratings. They told members that other people were sinners and that their, their lies to the VA were right with God. Veterans were required to make a variety of payments, such as weekly offerings, monthly offerings, electric bill offerings, and soul-winning offerings. Do you know what soul-winning is, Lauren? No. It's when they go out and, like, recruit people, and if they get someone to join. Oh, God. Soul-winning. That's what that's called, is soul-winning. Oh, I don't like that. No. I don't like that. No. No. Jesus fucking terrifying mm. a former minister a former minister of the church and dennis's personal assistant darnell emmanuel told military.com quote they would shame people into giving more money especially if they knew you had a va disability rating emmanuel was a iraq war veteran and said that veterans with high disability ratings were considered heroes in the church because of the extra income they generated not for their sacrifice. their service <laughs> right <laughs> When money was donated, the church leaders saw it as an opportunity to get free labor for the church, like landscaping and roof maintenance, since none of these veterans needed to actually work for a full-time job. Mm -hmm. 
So in 2020, Veterans Education Success, which is a nonprofit that oversees the use of the GI Bill benefits, sent a report to the Veterans Administration, so the VA, yeah. asking about the abuse of the GI program by HOPC. Education success ensures success for military-connected students who are using the GI Bill and other federal education benefits. They weed out waste, fraud, and abuse, which is why they sent an 11-page letter to the VA about HOPC, suspicious dealings with veterans' GI Bill benefits and disability. Mm -hmm. So, shout out to education. <laughs> yeah. The Fayetteville Observer, right? The Fayetteville Observer reported these allegations, among many others, in the letter. Hop, okay. hop would deceive the VA during inspections. They would lie to inspectors about how much time students would be spending in class, and instead of being in class, students were actually out recruiting members or doing other work for the church. Soul winning. Mm-hmm. That great firm. Mm-hmm. The church would change the names of classes to satisfy VA requirements since federal dollars can't be used for a student to repeat a course. <laughs> Sucks. Most of the classes resembled a regular Sunday school session around different elements of the Bible. Former member Arlene Braden said, quote, we wanted all of them there full time. So we renamed the classes so they could retake the class. The church would have students dressing up the building by bringing in desks and books to make the church look like they had functional classrooms. They lied about the percentage of veteran students attending the classes to make it seem like more civilians attended the classes. They lied about oh. the number of students attending in one program that had been approved for the GI Bill funding, saying all of the students in different states were attending the approved program. They would charge significantly higher tuition to VA students. The letter said, quote, civilians were given in-house grants to reduce the price or were later reimbursed if they paid full price. By contrast, student veterans were billed the full price of tuition. They would lie to the VA about the teachers' college degrees and salaries. Teachers only had certificates and they were not paid at all, which is really not that much different than public school. I was just going to say, I was going to say, <laughs> that sounds kind of similar. Yeah, but they really, like, weren't paid. Like, nothing. Like, at yeah. all. Hop would change the class name or reteach the material to keep students enrolled longer. The letter stated, quote, for example, Hop had a class called the Book of Moses. Moses's, actually. Oh, plural. <laughs> right. Hop, Hop broke up the course into five separate classes, each covering one of the five books. The letter goes on to say, quote, students who took the original book of Moses's course were required to take five separate classes, even though they covered the same material. This allowed Hop to continue to collect tuition money. One student Jeez. attended classes for 10 years in three different states. With the GI Bill, I'm pretty sure like you only have a certain amount of time for it. Like it's not you, like you, you can have... just go to school forever. Yeah, it depends on how long your service was. Yeah, but even then, like... I just feel like it's not going to provide you schooling forever. Yes, I agree. I also, why would you take that long? I would give up after like year three. Right. <laughs> Maybe make it to year four, you know, typical four years. Yeah. Another student was taking classes for 12 years in Georgia. Both students had used up all their benefits and never received a certificate of completion. The letter says, quote, it is highly unlikely that receiving a certificate from Hopkes Bible seminaries would benefit students in any way. It also said, quote, a HOP certificate would only allow graduates to preach or teach at HOP churches and Bible seminaries. It kind of reminds me of Trump College. Mm -hmm. Remember when that was a thing? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> right. It wasn't real. So exactly. people who this went is... there would go to school and pay all this money and then have nothing because it wasn't legitimate. Yeah. Well, if your dumbass is going there. I know. God. <laughs> um, allegedly, women veteran students were not allowed to preach or teach in the church, even though they used their benefits to attend the classes. Mm -hmm. The credits were also non-transferable to any other school. Hop would manipulate veterans into donating their VA disability compensation to the church. The letter said, quote, many veterans were even allegedly told that God blessed you with the disability compensation so you could give your time to him and not worry about working a regular job. As we know, they targeted veterans in order to access the GI Bill funding, VA disability compensation, and VA home loans. One former member, Gladys Jordan, told the Daily Beast that she hasn't seen her son, 28-year-old Cesar Vargas, since he left the church in 2016. She said that every time she would call him, he would say, ma'am, how did you get this number? Gladys' Aww. son is now $50,000 in debt and never had a real job and spent money he didn't have on materials necessary to conduct services. Gladys wow. described Dennis as being 
infatuated with Jim Jones. Gladys told the Daily oh. Mail, quote, this is a modern day Jim Jones cult. That's my scare that he's going to take my son to another country and do the same thing that Jim Jones, Jim Jones did. In reference to their Bible college, she told reporters, quote, they have a fraudulent Bible college and a so-called home for soldiers. They bring them in and give them a home cooked meal. And from there, they have them lie to the VA to get into the Bible college. They steal their benefits and they never get a diploma from there that's worth anything because it's not valid. So a little bit more on this Jim Jones comparison. <laughs> so the blog site did a great job at tying together the comparisons between Jim Jones and Ronnie Dennis. Oh, okay. Let me hear it. So both claim to being supernatural and the blog goes way into it. And at this point I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's pick one. <laughs> so I picked the grossest to go into. <laughs> <laughs> So they both claimed to being supernatural. They had an intercom, polycom system to be able to reach everybody. Right. Anyone who left is automatically considered gay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And then by far, the sickest is the control over the children. And so this is what oh. the blog said. The blog reported, quote, if someone is a faithful member, the children must be in the day school. One child told their parents that their teacher at school was teaching the kids that if they overhear their parents speak of leaving the church they are to run away to another church member's house and that the church would help them become emancipated ronnie dennis also has a private school at his house for a select group of girls that are there to entertain his daughter he believes oh. that his daughter is better than the normal church kids so he has created a fake society for his daughter to live in she will never know what it's like to make her own friends because her friends are assigned to her these girls that come to be in school with her are also there all day, just about every day to play with her. Whenever she wants these friends, Ronnie Dennis calls the parents and tells them to bring their kids to his house at such and such time. They are not even given an option. Many times the parents of these girls will only see their own kids late at night when they get the call to come pick up their kids. One child has it even worse. Ronnie Dennis always goes out of town to his beach homes for about two weeks before coming back to Hinesville for two weeks. While he is gone, this one girl always goes with him, and her parents just have a type of shared custody situation with her. This has gone on for years, just so that he can create the perfect and controlled utopia for his daughter at the expense of others. Wow. That is actually incredibly insane. Uh oh, we are about to do full tip. So, remember Adam Bowles and how he mm -hmm. said that Dennis had uh, his wife Julie leave him and move in with him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, supposedly, when she left, she isolated herself for several years inside Dennis's house. She eventually cut off all of her family and friends, even within the church, and only had contact with one person, Dennis. Oh, my God. Dennis denied that she was ever trapped there, but H-O-P-C-C... Hop.com. <laughs> Sorry. Wrote that she displayed signs of someone who had been a prisoner or tortured mentally and physically... She changed her name to Phoebe Ruth Dennis, and everyone knew that Dennis considered Phoebe to be his second wife. Oh. Everyone knew it was wrong, but too afraid to speak out against it, they went along with it. Even Dennis's first wife, Marjorie. Dennis got Julie Phoebe to open accounts for a nonprofit that wasn't real and hid it within the church, and they would use it to funnel money in and out over the years. And mm -hmm. Dennis and Phoebe slash Julie uh, were co-account owners on several bank accounts. So she's also now in trouble because she she has her name on all these like pieces of paper right with like bringing money over and like there's a bunch of money orders and things like that. Right. Exactly. So of um, course she would be connected. Right. So that's when Julie left Adam. That's what that turned into. OK. Yeah. So there are audio recordings on hop.com the website that are recorded interviews from former members and secret recordings and meetings. One blog post does talk about abuse that was allegedly happening to children. One girl of reported course. going, right. One girl did report going on these trips that I had mentioned earlier with Dennis, but she said there were other girls there, including Dennis's daughter. And mm -hmm. there's one instance, Dennis ended up beating all the girls he had taken for the trip. Um, he was unhappy about something. I couldn't bring myself to listen to the whole video, so you are welcome to go check out yourselves. The girl did say that Dennis had started being his own daughter before he even got to the room with the other girls. So, 
as of 2023, meaning as of this year. Right. This year that's only been lasting, what, seven months so far? Mm -hmm. So as of 2023, in January, a civil forfeiture complaint for $150,191 in cash held in bank accounts. The complaint also alleged that seminary officials deceived the VA, falsified financial records, lied about faculty qualifications, and fabricated course catalogs. Uh, The report I read said that House of Prayer had required $23 million dollars in VA benefits for more than 200 military members, veterans, and family members to attend HOP schools. Jeez. The complaint also claims that HOP misrepresented hours spent in class, falsified attendance records, encouraged students to lie to officials, and failed to grade assignments or provide graduation completion records. Court Watch reported, quote, investigators found that House of Prayer and various other entities it controlled used at least 20 financial institutions and 80 different bank accounts to move federal money around and attempt to evade detection. Oh, wow. Tax churches. Absolutely. They should not be tax exempt. Like, ugh. Ugh. March. Funds forfeited from ra- from the raid... Uh, and the church was so the funds were forfeited from the raid from whatever the FBI did. And I guess the church also received its final notice about like this complaint that's been against them. If they don't say anything, then it's almost like a decision is put in for you, mm, which mm-hmm. since they didn't submit a request to challenge the complaint, subsequently, they were essentially pleading the fifth. So for any okay. non-Americans out there, we <laughs> have amendments as part of our constitution and the fifth amendment so if you ever heard the saying i plead the fifth meaning like you don't want to incriminate yourself so that's you saying you don't have to say anything if you don't want to right because what you said could incriminate you so you're allowed Mm -hmm. to not say anything yeah so (laughs) there you go (laughs) my mom and i were watching a show and someone must have had a british accent (laughs) definitely was not from here and one of the people was American and he's like, I plead the fifth. And I go, oh, people from America don't know what that means. <laughs> My mind was blown. <laughs> uh, as of May of this year, a court sealed civil lawsuit has been filed against the House of Prayer targeting Ronnie Dennis. The hop.com. So remember, H-O-P-C-C, all lowercase, dot com mm-hmm. continues to post updated information about the court proceedings and they have. They have many official court documents, so I'm, I really think the information is legit, and they can go a lot more in depth. So, final thought before I kind of wrap things up. Uh, Rick Allen, who is the executive director of the Cult Education Institute, told Military.com, quote, When we see somebody who is a member of a destructive cult or a destructive authoritarian group like House of Prayer, we don't really understand how isolated they are. He went on to say, quote, the leader indoctrinates the members to have unreasonable fears of the outside world. You have to understand that once people have become involved in a group like this, that becomes their social environment. So that's where their friends are. That's where their family may be. And if they leave, they will be cut off. And especially if they grew up in this, this is all they know. And that is the House of Prayer Christian Church. So charges pending. Actually, no criminal charges have been filed. It's all civil lawsuits so far. I, I mean, even just moving around money, that I feel like that's illegal. Yeah, there's. I think that's going to be more of the federal side. It, it was hard to tell, like, because the FBI didn't tell anybody, like, any reporters why they were mm-hmm. raiding. And I still don't know if they told, like, why. Right. This is just all other investigative work that people have done to figure out what's going wow. on. Wow. Yeah. So. They raided the churches in June of 2022, and as of May 2023, Uh civil lawsuits, I know, have been against the church. Well, at least there's something, and it might be a waterfall type of thing where these ones start, and then from there, it just keeps going. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole stuff with the VA and, like, Oh, that's definitely going to be federal. Yeah, I think that's really where they're going to meet their downfall. Which is essentially how, I mean, because the only reason why we know about this cult in the first place, because even though there had been protests about it and there's the whole website that has been up since at least 2017, 2018, 
the only reason this is really, really coming into the news is because the education success people back in 2020 sent a letter to the VA being like, uh, hey, some shady shit is going on here. You need to take a look at them. And then it blew up. Good. So there was some guy, I think he was a representative. He was someone for the VA and he was like, this is embarrassing. Yeah, it is. And I'm like, it should be. <laughs> yes, you should have to like at least check to see where the VA money is going and like the GI Bill and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So. Wow. And especially because yeah. it's modern day. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Damn. Yep, yep, yep. Well, nice coverage. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I did not think Georgia would be like this. Cold fucking central, my guy. Like. Damn. Jeez. I guess a lot of it would be like religious cults too because it's such a religious area, you know? Mm -hmm. Bible Belt. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Um, follow, follow us, us on TikTok. Yeah. And follow us everywhere. If you like any of our things, rate and review us any of that. Send us a message. Let us know. Or email us at a scary state podcast at gmail.com and we'll send you a little something. Yep. And every Tuesday on TikTok, well, and Instagram, but mostly on TikTok, uh, you get a teaser for the coming week's episode. So make sure you check those out. I work really hard on them. So please like them. They're very fun. And yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening and stay scary. Stay safe. <laughs>